<laughs> I've been here. <laughs> I bet. You had a lot to do. Yeah. yeah you missed all the activity. <laughs> oh, there was still plenty left here for me when I got back. Oh, I'm sure you had the cleanup stuff, yeah. I've, I've been here. <laughs> okay, yeah, gentlemen, you're live. Yeah. Gentlemen, you are live. Activity. Thank you. Welcome to the Public Safety Committee meeting for the City of San Clemente, Tuesday, November 10th. It is now 3.05. All right. I will do the call to order. Uh, Chair Bercuda. Yes, we're going to let's uh, do the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, uh, I need to do that. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, after you. No, you have a. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going ahead in the uh, agenda. OK, this is uh, number two on the agenda. Uh, Joe, will you uh, lead us into the Pledge of Allegiance? Certainly. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Glad I didn't forget it. Adam, will you do the roll call? Yes, sir. Uh, Chair Bercuda. Here. Vice Chair Janice. Here. Committee Member Walsh. Here. Committee Member Leffler. Here. Fire Chief Capo Bianco. Here. Police Services uh, Lieutenant Manhart. Here. Uh, Marine Safety Chief uh, Malott. Here. All right. Well, it looks like the next thing on the agenda is uh, the presentation from uh, Chief Malott. Okay. Um, hello and good afternoon. My name is Rod Malott. Um, just to give you a little background um, about myself, I started my career as an ocean lifeguard with the City of San Clemente Marine Safety Division in 1987. Promoted to ocean lifeguard supervisor in the early 90s and from there, I went on and promoted to full-time status in 2001. And then I was promoted to Marine Safety Lieutenant in 2006 and recently served as an interim lifeguard chief since late December of 2019 until late October of this year. I've been promoted to Marine Safety Captain as of late October of this year. <clears throat> so um, I wanna thank you for having me and appreciate your time, all the committee members. I've been asked to provide an overview of Marine Safety Division and what goes into operating a successful ocean lifeguard program. I have quite a few slides to get through, so I'll, I will try and be quick in the interest of everyone's time this afternoon. The beach is a very exciting environment. Surfers, swimmers, and bodyboarders all enjoy the consistent surf available in San Clemente. It can also be very dangerous. Our job is to help make sure that everyone returns home safely. Next. Lifeguard services were established in San Clemente on July 16, 1931 by city council vote. Next year, 2021, Marine Safety will have provided lifeguard service for 90 years. Procedures, equipment, and technology have changed throughout the years, but primary goal of protecting swimmers in the ocean has not, and the division currently provides service for over 2 million visitors annually. Lifeguard operations is a seven-day-a-week, year-round operation from hours of operation are from 8 a.m., excuse me, 8 a.m. till sunset. And staffing levels fluctuate with the time of year and crowds and conditions. During the slowest times of the year, we have a minimum of three lifeguards on duty. Next. The mission statement for the Marine Safety Division is to maximize the safety and well being of beach visitors to San Clemente Beach and Marine Environment through comprehensive public education and responsive emergency intervention. So in short, our mission is still the same as it was in 1931 to ensure that everyone at the beach has a safe and enjoyable day. 
To this day, we still rely on quality people, the men and women sitting in the towers, watching thousands of swimmers, preventing danger when possible and responding to emergencies. Marine Safety provides emergency services from North Beach to Lawson, a mile north of the pier and a mile south of the pier. Next, some key statistics for 2019. Um, you'll see on the, on the slide here, swimmers rescued, 1,663. Pre-events, 20, over 26,000. Um, Pre-events are verbal warnings to people who are in a position where if they remain or continue, their safety would be compromised. And that's a, what we consider a prevent. Medical aids, over 1,300. Warnings and enforcements, over 11,000. Ocean safety talks and to participants, over 34,000. And zero drownings. Uh, next. So this is our organizational chart down here at Marine Safety. Um, Public Works Director, um, I report to Tom Bonnegut. As I mentioned earlier, I've been promoted to Marine Safety Captain. Next in line down, down the chart here, you have Marine Safety Lieutenant. That position is vacant at the time. Um, working with HR with recruitment for in-house. And so if you go down below that, you'll see there's four Marine Safety Officers so one of those four will be promoted to the Marine Safety Lieutenant's position. And so Ian Burton's a Marine Safety Officer, Nick Juney, Blake Anderson, and Sean Staudenbar. Um, we have an office specialist, uh, two, Lindsay Polk. She's three-quarter time. Um, she helps out with the administration of the uh, division. And down below the Marine Safety Officers, we have Ocean Lifeguard Supervisors. We have two that are benefited part-time supervisors. One is Trevor Malosh and one position is vacant. Uh, next week, we are running in-house recruitment for that. So hopefully um, we'll have someone in that position soon. And Ocean Lifeguard, uh, non-benefited supervisors, we have part-time three of those positions and all currently filled with those. And down below, we have approximately 42 lifeguards that are seasonal part-time. So off to the right-hand side, you see that we have a junior lifeguard coordinator and supervisor. So one of the, in the past, it's been one of the supervisors that have been the coordinator. Um, it's been overseen by the Marine Safety Lieutenant. Um, we have seven instructors. They kind of go back and forth. Um, all the JG instructors are also ocean lifeguards. So next. So we have 45 part-time lifeguards. The part-time lifeguards are the backbone um, of the division. They observe and respond to emergencies, public relations, first aids, and public ed ed education instructors. Okay, next. So staffing and equipment at Marine Safety. Um, as I mentioned earlier, right now we have um, on the books five full-time employees. Um, and we have three regular part-time employees. So those three regular part-time are two supervisors and one ed office uh, specialist too, and 42 seasonal um, ocean lifeguards. As far as uh, we have five four-wheel drive rescue vehicles, and that is two Jeeps. You see that yellow Jeep in the, uh, in the picture there. And we have three ATVs. So we have two uh, Jeeps and three ATVs and one personal watercraft. Uh, we have a scuba dive team that consists of our five full-time. We have um, automated external defibrillators in all the five rescue vehicles. We have observation cameras um, spread out throughout the beach that we use um, to monitor emergencies and allocate resources. And we also have a, a remote observation system, which is a drone that we put into operations as well. Uh, next. Lifeguard headquarters with the iconic clock tower was built in 1969. Headquarters is centrally located on the beach and continues to aid in the success of lifeguards protecting the lives of those who visit the beaches here in San Clemente. Headquarters serves as a year round landmark for public assistance, both with emergencies and general assistance information. Other functions of headquarters, uh, we have a first aid room, a dispatch center, admin offices, a training center for over a thousand students annually, 
the staging of six emergency vehicles, lifeguard and junior lifeguard equipment storage, locker rooms with hot showers, uh, heavy beach maintenance equipment storage, and Orange County Sheriff's Department stores their beach patrol vehicles as well. Um, the admin offices um, inside of headquarters allows the full-time staff and those working in those positions to serve as active lifeguards and respond to emergencies as well. Um, ha having headquarters on the beach allows for close su supervision of beach operations, provides immediate response to emergencies, serves as a medical facility and staging area for paramedics, and also provides a quick access to hot showers for hypothermia patients and stingray patients. Next. We are fortunate in the picture here, you see what we call zero tower. We are fortunate to have this central vantage point for lifeguards to observe our beaches, which is our tower zero located on the pier. Our operational philosophy is to provide a minimum of two lifeguards on duty during the daylight hours, 365 days a year. So this tower is open. Um, we Business hours are from 8 a.m. to sunset year round. This tower is open somewhere between 8.10 in the morning to 8.15. And um, from zero tower, lifeguards can see, can see approximately 85% of the beach. The portion that is blocked out is from Mariposa Point to about 204, just because of the way it's situated on the pier. In the off season, this tower is used as a dispatcher and also a response to emergencies as well. The tower is staffed with two lifeguards during peak hours during the summer season for about five hours each day. Summer season runs from Memorial Weekend through Labor Day weekend. We staff 13 towers on the beach, six towers south of the pier and seven north of the pier. The towers are spread out between North Beach and Los Lawson's Beach. The towers are brown and tan in color on all sides of the tower and will have their tower number on all sides of the tower. Neighboring agency to the south is California State Lifeguards, and they have blue towers. So if you're ever out there and reporting something, take a look at the tower and let us know what color of tower and number you're at. It would help us tr tremendously. In the summer, we run four emergency vehicles out on the beach during peak hours. Um, and HQ is staffed with a full-time dispatcher and a watch commander during the summer season. During the off season, we don't have a full time dispatcher. The admin who's working as a watch commander will serve as a dispatcher as well. Weekday staffing in the summer, we have approximately 32 lifeguards per day. This includes field operations and JG instructors. We have 27 lifeguards per day on weekends during the summer season. July 4th and Ocean Fest, we have 40 lifeguards working shifts on these major holidays. And you'll see at times a few of the lifeguard towers must be staffed by more than one lifeguard to be able to keep up with the ocean rescue activity that has increased yearly average to over 2,000 swimmer rescues per year. Um, as far as uh, communications, 11 of the 13 beach towers that we staff have phones. So that's how we communicate from headquarters to pier tower or zero tower. And the other two are on 800 megahertz radios. The phone system is located in HQ Pier Tower and all the beach towers, um, like I was saying, have hard lines and communicate via phone besides the two towers that are on 800 megahertz. We have PA systems located on the pier, HQ, and all the emergency response uh, vehicles. All emergency vehicles are on 800 megahertz. They have mobile phones and PA systems. Outside mutual aid channels, we have with other Orange County lifeguard agencies, we have the ability to communicate with those lifeguard agencies and with Orange County Harbor Patrol and OCFA. Uh, inside the headquarters, we have four 800 council base stations. Um, I'm sorry, we have two of those in headquarters and we have two up in the pier tower and we have eight handheld radios. Next. Certifications, we are certified through the United States Life Saving Association. Um, all the lifeguards, seasonal tower lifeguards are uh, certified first aid, CPR, AD, 
and the supervisors and full-time are all search and arrest procedures, PC 32 certified and can issue citations. We have a scuba certificates, EMT certificates for all supervisors and full-time. And there are a, a few uh, non-supervisors that have been, um, went out and got their EMT certification as well. And we're all have certified emergency driving and personal water craft operations. Uh, next. So each year, you know, we have a, a retention it used to be guard stayed for 10, 15 years. That's not so much the case for many years now. So we conduct lifeguard tryouts um, sometime in late February. Understanding how these men and women become lifeguards shed some light on the quality of employees working within marine safety. The majority of employees are recruited from local high school, college swim teams. Since outstanding swimming skills are a prerequisite for being able to perform ocean rescues in a variety of dangerous and challenging conditions. This limits the field of potential applicants to a very select group. And applicants run through two initial physical tests prior to being interviewed. One of these tests is an 800 yards ocean swim to the end of the pier and back, and only the top applicants are invited to the second test. The second test consists of a 400 yard run followed by a 400 yard swim and another 400 yard run. The run swim run event simulates skills required by a tower lifeguard who runs to the rescue, swims out and back and then back to the tower. The potential of field applicants is further cut, reflecting how they perform on the run swim run. Once the initial physical tests are complete, top applicants are invited to an interview process. At the interview, applicants are given an opportunity to show their skill in public speaking, thinking on their feet, and explaining their qualifications. Extracurricular achievements such as community service, leadership, or other skills are used to pick the cream of the crop for potential lifeguards. Next. Once applicants have passed the physical test and interview process, the real fun begins. Applicants are hired at minimum wage and invited to participate in a competitive rookie training program that is run on weekends in spring for, for approximately 100 hours. The Ocean Lifeguard Training Program the city offers has resulted from years of development by marine safety staff members employing the best practices and pro available. The city, as I mentioned earlier, the city of San Clemente is certified by the United States Life Saving Association association and maintains a high standard of training with all of our lifeguards. Each day in training, trainees are tested physically and academically. Over the course of five weekends, um, they are tested um, physically and mentally and the top scores are promoted to ocean lifeguards and are invited to work as ocean lifeguards for the city of San Clemente. Next. Lifeguard training, as you see in the picture, um, as I mentioned, one of the functions of marine safety is having a training center. So all the returning lifeguards receive 18 hours of training annually. The training center is also used for joint agency training and for junior lifeguard classroom lesson plans and ocean safety presentations as well. Next. Marine safety division is comprised of two programs. First, is lifeguard operations, which includes ocean rescue, medical aid, law enforcement, public relations, and oversight of special events. The second program is our prevention education program, which includes junior lifeguards, seven classes, and a beach safety outreach program where we teach ocean safety to groups and community or civic groups. Next. The operation and rescue division uh, rescues, we average um, approximately 2,200 rescues per year. Um, the highest number of rescues in one year was over 4,600 rescues in one year, and that was back in 2009. Rip currents are the leading hazard to beachgoers. Approximately 90% of all rescues performed in San Clemente are due to swimmers caught in rip currents. A rip current is a powerful current of water pulling away from shore. Rip currents can occur every day in San Clemente. The bigger the waves, the bigger the rip currents. Panic swimmers try to counter a rip current by swimming straight back to shore, putting themselves at risk because of fatigue. Next. 
Here you see uh, one of the towers double staff, the men and women sitting in the towers watching thousands of swimmers preventing danger when possible and responding to emergencies. Like I was mentioned, some of the high um, frequency busy towers will be double staffed uh, during the summer season. Next. This is a photo of a rip current. Uh, you'll see in that slide there, you'll see seven victims. And um, I guarantee you that lifeguards are in route and multiple lifeguards for this. Um, rip currents are a channel of churning choppy water. The area having notable difference in water color, the line of foam, seaweed, or debris moving steadily seaward, the break and incoming wave pattern, uh, one, all, or none of these clues may be visible. Some rip current safety tips, relax. Rip currents don't pull you under. Don't swim against the current, swim out of the current by swimming to the side of the current and then swim to shore. If you can't escape, float or tread water. If you need help, wave or uh, yell for assistance. Next. Another component of our um, program is medical aids. We average about 1,200 medical aids annually. All tower guards are trained in first aid for public safety, approved curriculum through the OCMS. Supervisors and full-time lifeguards are certified EMTs. And the OCFA is summoned when higher level of care is needed other than an EMT. Next. Another component is our law, law enforcement. We average over 10,000 contacts a year. Lifeguards make approximately 10,000 contacts annually. The goal of lifeguard enforcement efforts are to enhance the quality of life in San Clemente by encouraging the cooperation of the public. Lifeguards lean more towards the spirit of the law versus the letter of the law in seeking compliance. However, the full-time and supervisor staff have public officer powers which allow them to issue citations as appropriate. This power is provided by the Muni Code 1.12.010. OCSD has beach patrol, you see in the beach patrol um, in, on the ATV there, uh, assigned to the beach during the summer months to assist with enforcement efforts with marine safety staff. Uh, excuse me, marine safety staff's number one goal with focusing on protecting those in the water. So it's a great asset to have them on the beach during the summer months. Next. Dive team, San Clemente's dive team is comprised of the division's five full-time lifeguards. The purpose of the San Clemente Marine Safety Dive Team is to search and recovery. The San Clemente Dive Team is one of, one of a number of ocean lifeguard teams in Orange County. All coastal dive teams cross train with coastal lifeguard agencies who respond to mutual aid bases to assist each other. Next. Um, another component is our personal watercraft. Um, having a watercraft is crucial to our lifeguard operations. A PD PWC is a cost effective. We can launch it, from, launch and retrieve um, from the beach. The ability to maneuver in close to shore with no exposed propeller means reduced injuries. We have a sled attached to the back of the PWC to transport rescue victims and medical aid patients. We use the PWC for special events, big surf, offshore emergencies, missing swimmer incidents, shark tagging project, and enforcements. Next. Okay, the other uh, program that we have is the Prevention Ed Program. As you see in the slide, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. As lifeguards, our primary goal is to prevent drownings. Our favorite way of educating beachgoers is through our Junior Lifeguard Program. Next. The Junior Lifeguard Program is the most popular city program offered in the city. The program has been running since 1963, 57 years. The Junior Lifeguards receive education and experience in ocean safety, first aid, rescue techniques, body surfing, bodyboarding, surfing, physical fitness, marine safety operations, and are instructed by marine safety ocean lifeguards. The program is conducted at Lifeguard Headquarters. We, uh, the program is limited to 840 students annually. Ages run from nine to 17. We have six sessions of, of the program that we offer in the months of June, July, and August. The sessions are three weeks and run Monday through Friday. Participants can either participate 
in a morning session from 9 to 12 or a p.m. session 1 to 4. We have several different levels um, within the junior life care program. We have a ripper level, JG1, JG2, JG3, and also a cadet program for those interested in pursuing a career as an ocean lifeguard. Next. Another component is the school outreach program. Um, each spring, lifeguards go out to eight elementary schools locally and provide ocean safety presentations to all the third, fourth, and fifth graders. We have many scout groups, school classes, et cetera, come down to lifeguard headquarters each year for ocean safety presentations as well as you can see in the slide that we conduct in our training center. Next. Some other components of our um, public education is our uh, presentation reaches over 40,000 people annually. Um, mentioned the local uh, elementary schools. We've also attend Camp Pendleton safety talks for the Marines. You can see uh, in that photo there, uh, a group of Marines. Um, supplemented with website safety information that you can get to on the city website. It's their warning flag system. Uh, every day the pier tower is open, so if you want to know what the conditions are, you can look at the flag system, which is green is generally safe, yellow means use caution, red is hazardous conditions. We also, for all lifeguard towers that are open, we'll have a weather board giving you the conditions, the tides, the water temperature, the surf size. During the off season or year round, the weather board at the base of the pier is filled out daily. Also, we have a surf report number um, that is updated at eight o'clock, 12 o'clock and five o'clock and gives you the surf and weather updates and is updated when conditions change as well. Uh, the public has access to the public beach cam. If you go to the city website, it'll give you a 180 degree view from the top of the clock tower which is a big hit for the public. And also um, you know, beach and ocean safety PSAs that we put out periodically. Next. Uh, part of the ocean safety program is shark information that's available on the city website. Um, give you some information um, about the general white shark information, reducing risks on shark encounters presentation to city council, a PowerPoint that was provided on June 6th of 2017, and also a presentation by Dr. Lowe at Shark Labs at Cal State Long Beach, the return of the big marine predators to California waters. Um, we also provide hotel tabletop uh, tents to local hotels that has um, safety information on there, and we distribute those. A Metro Lake Beach safety announcements for the beach train that comes, is give them uh, passengers safety uh, message. We also have a life jacket loaner program here at headquarters that if someone wants to utilize a life jacket, they have the ability to do that. And also on the city trolley, um, there are beach educational posters as well. Um, we also have a neighborhood beach watch for civic groups, surf teams, surf classes, and beach contract classes. And I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and also partnerships to raise funds. Um, so as far as raising funds and partnerships, you know, Ocean Festival has been a long-standing partner with Marine Safety, a big supporter in giving grant money that's been used for junior lifeguards uh, scholarships. The Gadaska Brothers donating funds through their Sokorama event each year that support the junior lifeguard program. Um, and also we have a St. Mary Lifeguard and Junior Lifeguard Foundation that was established in 2013. The board is comprised of community leaders and former St. Mary City lifeguards who are dedicated to the safety of our beaches and supporting our lifeguard and junior lifeguard programs. The mission for the foundation is dedicated to enhancing the safety and well-being of visitors to the beach through education, developing and building community partnerships obtaining and providing resources directly supporting the San Clemente Marine Safety Division's lifeguard and junior lifeguard programs. The foundation also supports preservation of history of the San Clemente lifeguarding. The past six years, the foundation has approved grants for an average of 9,000 annually. Some examples of the approved grants are scholarships with our junior lifeguards, assortment equipment for junior lifeguards, 
competition fees for junior lifeguards to go to, um, a Catalina field trip, uh, trip for the cadets, and a promotional video to promote junior lifeguards. Lifeguard equipment, um, they donated the DGI inspired drone. Uh, they purchased bina uh, binoculars for rookies, a floor imager, beach cam monitors that are used in dispatch. They've also provided educational resources as well. Next. So back to, uh, I was told you I would mention Neighborhood Beach Watch. This is a community partnership. Lifeguards can't do it alone. Everyone helped to save lives. Um, it's to create a safer beaches. We Lifeguards provide free training for the public and how to recognize ocean dangers, swimmers in distress, and how to uh, do go about that and observe, report, and respond. They get training on how to identify ocean hazards, how to observe and recognize someone in danger, how to call for help, and how to safely respond if already doing so. Okay, next. Okay, so um, July 4th is kind of like a Super Bowl for lifeguards. Lifeguards have a uh, average about 130 rescues each year on July 4th over the last five years. Most of the towers on the beach are double staffed to assist with the volume of calls and limited access for backup emergencies with units uh, to the towers. Um, next. Ocean Festival is a fantastic community event hosted by volunteers and brings up to 60,000 visitors over the weekend that attend the event. The event takes place on the third weekend of July annually. And I believe in 2020 that they'll be celebrating 45 years. And the, the event has many things going on, water competitions, story races, swim races, paddle events, and surf contests, Woody stage on the pier, concert on the beach, you know, whole assortment of events going on both sides of Peter and Park Del Mar. Just for this event, we dedicate over 10 lifeguards to the water competitions on top of a normal busy weekend lifeguard operations. Next. Another community favorite event is the beach concert series put on by the recreation division. The concerts are spread out throughout the summer and bring uh, a few thousand to the beach to these events in the evening until sunset, enjoying the music and the beautiful beach and summer sunsets. Next. Another community event on the pier and beach is the Sea Fest event that is put on by the Chamber of Commerce that is conducted on the pier and also a surf contest on the north side of the pier. This is held in October, as you can see. Summer season has a lot of moving parts and having well-trained lifeguard staff in support of the community, city staff, city administration, council, and outside agencies such as OCSD and OCFA allow marine safety to continue running a successful lifeguard operation and protecting over 2 million beach visitors each year. Next. So I will say, um, as much as lifeguarding has changed over the years, the core of a successful ocean lifeguard department will always be built on lifeguard in the beach tower and the guard's ability to distinguish a struggling swimmer amongst the thousands and to react instantly with speed in saving the person's life. This concludes my presentation. Uh, on the slide provides some numbers, our business number, 3618289, a surf and weather report number, and if, um, People are interested in junior lifeguard or public education, they can reach us at the number listed on the slide. This concludes my presentation. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. If you have questions, I'll be here throughout the meeting and will be available for you at any point. I encourage the committee members to contact me to come down to the beach to see how we do business once we are out of the COVID-19 pandemic and schedule a ride along if you're interested. Thanks again for your time. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Good job. It's a very comprehensive uh, overview. I appreciate uh, your time on that. And congratulations on your promotion, too. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, it's a good time to ask a question. Or... I think go ahead. Uh, what is your annual budget? 
Yeah, she, uh, I don't have that number right on top of my tongue right now. I'm sorry for that. Um, okay. I can I can pull that up while we're doing the meeting and tell you. Apologize for that. Okay. No, it's is it chief or captain at this point? That's Marine safety captain. 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 Very good. Um, now. Um, Oh, the city council uh, wanted to uh, suggest that uh, you join us in our uh, as a non voting member. Have you been uh, uh, sworn in yet? Uh, no, I haven't. We're going to take care of that. But uh, welcome. I, we really appreciate it because uh, you you are a major player in the public safety in the, in our community and a lot of people don't know it. But uh, I was certainly impressed when I when I met you uh, on the phone and and uh, worked with you a little bit there. So uh, congratulations and welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, hey, Captain Malata, I, can I ask you a couple of quick questions? Sure. Yeah. The, the, the first is when you're uh, off season and you don't have dispatchers working, how how would you from a tower contact uh, or how would you request police response. I'm sorry, could you ask that again? I'm sorry. Yeah, on the off season when you don't, you said you didn't have assigned dispatchers. If you're in a tower or you're out on patrol and you want and you need police response, how would you request that? Oh, okay. So, you know, like I was saying earlier in the off season, at minimum, we have three lifeguards on, a du on duty. So I serve as a watch commander. So I'm inside headquarters. We always have someone up in the pier tower and then either someone's doing, you know, out on patrol and if someone, you know, from the public had a call, I would receive that call. If I was out of the office and responding to emergency, I would forward the phones up to our pier tower. So there's always someone available from 8 a.m. till sunset year round. I, well, I, I guess specifically, so you, you can go on 800 megahertz and you can talk directly to OCSD dispatch? Uh, no. Uh, if, to talk to OCSC, we would be using the phone and call 911. If it was, uh, you know, if it was emergency, if it was non, um, just a normal deputy request that wasn't uh, life threatening, then it would be, you know, their dispatch line. Okay, 911. Okay, and uh, also you, you said during your law enforcement uh, uh, segment, you talked about the, the municipal code giving you authority to cite, but what, what training do you guys go through regarding law enforcement contacts? So all, all the PC, uh, all the supervisors in full time or PC 832 uh, go through for that. And then we also um, work jointly with the Orange County Sheriff's Department on an annual basis. They come in and give us refreshers each year about issuing citations, officer safety and whatnot. Okay, and, and the one last quick one is, uh, we, we don't have a Baywatch boat. If, if you necessitate a boat, who do who responds for that? So you're saying if we requested a, a boat for our department or for uh, if we? No, I mean I, I I mean we don't we don't have one. So if you need one, who do you? What 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 entity responds? Well, we have a personal watercraft. So if we have a need to put a watercraft into the water, we can launch our watercraft, which can be done. You know, within minutes, um, it's staged in our lifeguard headquarters. If we needed additional assistance, uh, if Surf Watch is out and about, we would con contact them. Or if we needed additional assistance from that, then we would call Harbor Patrol as well. And, and, and what is Surf Watch? Uh, that's a California State um, lifeguard vessel. And then uh, Gary, the answer to your question is 1.9 million dollars is our annual budget. Okay, very good. Thank you. And, and thank you too, Captain, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Good job. Vice Chair Janice, are you uh, with us? Uh, gentlemen, Mr. Janice is having some audio issues. I'm helping him right now. Got it, okay. Good job, okay. Any other questions for the uh, the captain at this point? Good. All right. Um, well, let's go to um, uh, Adam. Give me a, 
uh, some information regarding the e-bike regulation, the, the study that uh, people are doing on it? Yes, thank you, Chair Burkuta, members of the Public Safety Commission. Uh, this uh, special presentation is related to some recent uh, council discussion about the uh, regulation of e-bikes. Um, uh, this matter was discussed at the last council meeting uh, of last Tuesday, and I wanted to provide uh, an update on the staff's uh, process um, reviewing regulations uh, regarding e-bikes and what impact that's going to have on the public safety committee. Additionally, I've received a number of public comments about this. So I will do the presentation, uh, which is quite short, and then I'll read the public comments. And uh, if there's any questions, um, maybe we can uh, discuss everything at the end. So at the last council meeting, uh, our, the city's recreation manager, Samantha Wiley, presented a, uh, um, uh, an update on what's, where staff is with the, uh, the regulation of e-bikes. And essentially, it was building off of the uh, Beaches, Parks, and Recreation Commission's work plan, uh, where they have recently been approved uh, specifically to, um, uh, to have a work plan project, uh, analyze the use of e-bikes and uh, potential enforcement and uh, any, any regulations that may uh, need to be adopted by the city. Um, the council would like that plan to be uh, uh, provided to the public safety committee for input. So at this time, staff's direction on this is to to, uh, to work with the public beaches, parks, and recreation commission on drafting uh, any ordinance update um, or, or uh, new ordinances related to e-bikes, rather, and then uh, that. Uh, that work, that draft will be presented at some point in time to the uh, Public Safety Committee for input uh, as, it, as it, it relates to the provision of public safety services in the city. Looking at the uh, project in the Beaches, Parks and Recreation Commission's work plan, they've got a project timeline of January to April of 2021. Um, I know that they're not meeting again until next month, so I, I don't know at this point exactly when this will come back to the committee, but uh, it will at some point in, in the development of, of uh, any regulations. So with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. I can read the public comments unless there's some questions you have uh, for me at this point. Uh, yeah. public, is it public comments on the e-bike thing? It is, okay. yes. I think go ahead. All right. Okay, the first is from Janet and Jim Hill. We truly value and appreciate the Beach Trail in San Clemente as it provides both residents and visitors of all ages a wonderful place to safely exercise and enjoy the outdoors and lovely views. As residents of San Clemente, we often walk the trail, but we have concerns about the use of bikes and e-bikes on the trail. The trail is narrow, just a few feet wide in places. Bike riders cannot always anticipate the unpredictable movements of children, pets, and others. The difference in speed, lack of reaction time, and limited ability of riders to avoid changes in pedestrians' movements creates an unsafe environment. In fact, we have witnessed both accidents and near accidents on the trail between bicyclists, and bicyclists, as well as between bicyclists and pedestrians. In short, combining people walking with children and pets with fast moving bicycles is not a good combination on the trail. Bikes already have many access points to the trail. Keep, uh, keeping bikes, particularly motorized ones, off the trail lets everyone safely enjoy walking and jogging alongside the beach. Uh, sincerely, Janet and Jim Hill. The next is uh, from Debbie Pesman. I have lived in my home above T Street since the mid 80s. I am on the trail four to five days a week, walking both directions. E-bikes should not be allowed on the, on the trail. They are dangerous, fast, and way too quiet. People, especially older folks, cannot hear them nor get out of the way fast enough. Also, the bike riders themselves act as if they have the right of way. They shouldn't. I think motorized bikes should be treated like scooters and have to obey driving regulations to, and stay on roads. I have seen more than one walker hit by a bike. Please correct this dangerous situation. 
Thank you very much, Debbie. The next is from Dean Page. Hello, and thank you for letting us tell you about what my family and I see happening with e-bikes on the beach trail. During the day, some riders are careful and respectful, but many drive way too fast, and some have surfboards on the bike, which makes them even more dangerous on the more narrow sections. And sooner or later, if it hasn't happened already, someone is going to get hurt and most likely file a lawsuit with the city of San Clemente. Because the e-bikes are so quiet, they sneak up on pedestrians, and it's usually not a positive response or interaction. Also at night, many of these e-bikes have built-in LED lights, uh, which are very uh, bright and disturbing the walkers trying to enjoy their nightly walks. I walk the beach trail five out of seven days a week and live in a place where I can see the beach trail. During the dark hours, they have become a real problem also. Common sense tells me that e-bikes should not be allowed on our beach trail at any time, day or night. Thank you, Dean Page. The next is from Donna Cunningham. I would like to recommend that no bikes be allowed on the trail, especially in the busy summer months. When I'm walking, they tend to appear from behind out of nowhere. It is startling and often can border on being quite dangerous. E-bikes, on the other hand, are the equivalent of a small motorcycle. Many of the e-bike riders travel at near highway speeds, often carrying boards on the sides, which make them quite uh, wide on the trail. When they speed by a walker, it's frightening and quite dangerous. I have had to ask riders to slow down on many occasions. The trail should be for walking Donna Cunningham. The next is from John Lucy. I believe that the motorized means of transportation are not currently allowed on the trails. E-bikes are designed to travel at speeds from 10 to 30 miles per hour. Speeds of bicycles are limited to 10 miles per hour on the trail. A significant amount of e-bike riders are easily exceeding 10 miles per hour. They are also weaving around the walkers without any respectful warnings. E-bikes should be banned from the trails just as motorbikes and motorcycles are not allowed. The next is from Monica Burek. Uh, I have heard that you are looking at the safety of e-bikes on trails. I just wanted to mention that I don't think the problem we have is limited to trails. It is, it is just a matter of time before a, ch uh, a child or teen on an e-bike is killed by a car. The kids are just not aware of the rules of the road and are going too fast and in ways that are not predictable to drivers, including riding in the bike lane on the wrong side of the road really quickly. If the city did an education campaign followed by a period of enforcement against teens with tickets for failing to follow these rules, even just using warning ticket uh, the first for the first violation, I think the problem would really improve. For community community education of kids or teens, how about reaching out uh, to all area schools, especially middle schools, to do presentations about rules of the road, trail speed limits, etc., and how these rules do apply to bike bikers and e-bikers. I think it would go a long way. Thank you for your hard work, Monica Burrick. The next is Kirk Steele, we live above the beach trail and almost daily see reckless riding by young riders. It is only a matter of time until there is a serious accident and I'm concerned the city will be found liable for not regulating this obvious danger. There should be no e-bikes allowed on the trail. I also suggest there be a minimum age for riding on city streets. In the last two weeks, I have had several close calls with kids on cell phones or oblivious to traffic. Please regulate these bikes before we have a tragic accident. Kirk and Bonnie Steele. The next is from Kathy Morris, to whom it may concern, e-bikes in San Clemente have gotten quite dangerous. There are no restriction on who rides them and at what speed or where. Please consider banning e-bikes on the San Clemente Trail from the state park to North Beach. Most of the riders have no regard for others on the trail. They ride at high speed. Their bikes are silent and cannot be heard when coming up behind a person walking on the trail. E-bikes should be kept to the speed limit. E-bikers should be required to wear helmets. Thank you for your consideration. Kathy Morris. All right, the next is from Chris Thornburg. E-bikes and pedestrian traffic on the beach trail do not mix. Adults and children, dogs, the elderly, moms with baby strollers all walk the trail at increased risk with the, cons with the constant present presence of high speed motor vehicles. While I can only estimate the speed of these vehicles, I can guess I have 
seeing children and adults riding them at 25 to 30 miles per hour on the trail. In the past, I have notified lifeguards, some on ATVs. They are empathetic, but express frustration trying to monitor, catch up with, or cite speeding cyclists. As the popularity of the trail increases and as COVID-19 increases trail traffic, e-bikes and pedestrians are bound to collide, resulting in grievous injury. Lawsuits against the city may follow. Please keep motorized vehicles on the street. They do not belong on the beach trail. Thank you, Chris Thornburg. The next is from J Jason Tran. It is, it's my understanding that you are taking comments on a hearing about e-bikes on the beach trail. I am an avid runner and spend a couple days a week on the trail, and I don't see any issue with e-bikes specifically. Whether it be e-bike or conventional, some of the cyclists are not respectful to the trail users who are on foot. When I say respectful, I mean that they do not follow any of the posted rules regarding cycling, speed recommendations, and or walking bikes on bridge, uh, bridges. Unfortunately, I feel the only way this can be mitigated is to restrict usage for all bikes or enhance enforcement on the trails. At the end of the day, enforcement is really the only answer. Even if all or some of the bike types are restricted from using the trail without someone there to enforce these rules, they will be broken. Honestly, I get more frustrated with groups of people walking shoulder to shoulder across the trail without any consideration for those who are passing by. I hope the city can come up with a fair compromise for everyone who uses the trail, even those on wheels. Best regards, Jason Tran. The next uh, comment comes from Karen Cerulli. As a concerned citizen, I am writing to express my support for discontinuing the use of e-bikes on the San Clemente Beach Trail. The trail is one of San Clemente's most attractive amenities, and the use of e-bikes on the trail has a significant negative impact on the safety and enjoyment of this amenity. Thanks for your consideration, Karen Cerulli. The next comment is from Katherine Foster. Hi, I am an e-bike rider and also a beach trail walker. I see no reason why e-bikes are allowed on the trail. We have a bike lane through town. That's where our bikes should be ridden. A lot of riders are not respectful of the pedestrians and are going way too fast. Have seen a lot of near misses. I know a lot of our surfer population ride the bikes to their surf spots from their homes and that's great, but should then get off and walk them to their destination. Don't get me wrong, I love my bike, but we'll continue to ride safely and respectfully. Kate Foster. All right, the next comment is from uh, Paul Whirl. We walk the trail a lot. Regular bikes are sometimes a hazard too, but nowhere near how dangerous e-bikes will be. If this is approved, get ready for a lot of EMS calls. These riders tend to speed, never announce that they are coming up from behind you, and are often simply not courteous sharers of the path. Hint, I have already encountered a number of them on the beach trail. The next comment comes from Jessica Johnson. I'm writing in response to e-bikes overall, not just uh, the bike trail. I think the committee needs to take a more holistic view as just be, as uh, versus just the beach trail. I see many kids with no helmets, not obeying traffic laws, which would cause which could cause a major accident or safety for other riders. They are also riding on sidewalks off El Camino Real. I almost hit three girls while trying to turn right out of Ralph's parking lot as they came flying through the intersection without looking, then almost hit them again when turning right at El Camino Real and Palazada, and they were going straight into the intersection when I had a green light. They were way behind me and, and would have T-boned me from behind if I didn't look again. Many drivers aren't as cautious. I also have an e-bike and think we need to put laws in place like a driver's permit or require bike safety class to ride these if under 21. They are low speed vehicles going 20 miles plus, uh, Jessica Johnson. The next comment comes from Chris Booth. These bikes are so dangerous on the bike trail and have no place there. People are walking, kids in strollers, dogs on leashes, et cetera. I have seen a couple near misses. People should only be able to walk them on the trail in my opinion. Thank you, Chris Booth. The next comment comes from Robin Luger. 
I walk daily on the concrete path between the green belt on, El on Camino de los Mares and Calle Nuevo. I am one of many seniors that has encountered kids on their electric bikes speeding down this path with no regard to those of us walking and sharing the walkway with them. Many times they are not solo riders and they are riding with two or three of their friends also on electric bikes, which leaves very little room on the path. At the very least, these bike riders should be riding single file when they're are walkers on the path. In my estimation, their speed is in excess of 25 miles per hour. I've asked them to slow down and am met with profanity show, uh, shouted back at me. When these riders approach from behind, it is hard to hear them due to how quiet the bikes are. When they pass by me, I am continually startled because I didn't know they were there. Thankfully, I haven't stepped to the side which would have been met with a bike crashing into me. They speed and are typically looking at their cell phones while riding with no regard for others. It's dangerous. Please put rules in place to take uh, that take these riders off the city park and beach pathways. Someone is going to get hurt on city property. Thank you, Robin Luger. The next comment uh, comes from, um, I'm sorry, I've already read that one. Uh, the last comment comes from Jim and Kathleen uh, Sigafoos. My wife Kathleen and I walk the beach trail every day. It is our mutual opinion that it is just a matter of time before there is a serious if not fatal accident. We frequently observe e-bikers operating at a dangerous speed and with complete disregard for other people on the trail. It is not uncommon to see e-bikers recklessly swerve in and out between people walking in opposite directions. Their actions are often predicated on the assumption that others will do exactly as they expect, but it is difficult to predict where people might go, particularly those of us with dogs. This is particularly true when they are overtaking as they make little noise. On several occasions, the first realization we had that e-bikers were overtaking was when they sped past, missing us seemingly by inches. We find e-bikers with side-mounted surfboards to be particularly problematic. They don't seem to realize the extra clearance that a side-mounted surfboard requires. Our recommendation is that there be, one, better posting of the speed limit on the trail, two, enforcement of the speed limit and other reckless operation of e-bikes by the OC Sheriff's Department, which seems to be totally lacking. Three, a lower age limit of 16 on the trail. We have noticed that the most reckless operators tend to be very young. Uh, four, the mandatory ringing of a horn or bell when overtaking. If the above actions don't result in improvement, e-bikes should be banned from the beach trail. Thank you for the opportunity to give input, Jim and Kathleen Sigafos. All right. And there was one other comment that was submitted uh, by email, but it was, it was submitted before the the uh, agenda was published, and I believe it was just uh, intended to be distributed to the uh, committee members. Um, every public comment that I just read, including um, some additional comments submitted, will be provided to all the council or to all the committee members uh, at the end of this meeting. And if hey, Adam, could could you make sure that these emails are all forwarded to the Beaches and Parks Committee? I will do. I, I can do so as well. I'll provide them to the recreation manager, Samantha Wiley, for distribution as she she sees fit to her commission. And, and the, the one last thing, I, it was some time ago when this e-bike thing start, first started uh, coming up, and uh, Cap, uh, I'm sorry, Chief Manhart and I had a a conversation a while back, uh, and we discussed this. It, 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 I know Chief took some action about it was more about enforcing or or i'll say proactively contacting kids without helmets on bikes and kids that might be in, in danger endangering themselves or others and I, I i know he did broach that subject because shortly afterwards uh uh Dep or sheriff barnes wrote wrote a letter to the city saying that they were aware of this and i was wondering if maybe because i hadn't talked to chief manhart since and if you could elaborate a little bit on um, what that process was? Yeah, we've had, uh, our, our motors have been out there. We've been, uh, we have been stopping individuals and not issuing citations, but educating them, um, especially if they're minors, uh, contacting their parents and letting them know that they're not wearing the appropriate safety equipment or they're not riding unsafe. 
Uh, we also have a grant that we will have, um, the traffic office will be out here um, doing enforcement uh, with regards to that. That was scheduled for last week, um, actually a couple weeks ago, but the fires, we went on tactical alert for the fire. So that's been rescheduled. So that'll also come up. Um, but we've been actively out there doing that and doing just what the comments were saying about uh, trying to educate the public and and not starting with enforcement, but educating them. And uh, it, it is difficult. It's challenging because these young individuals, uh, <laughs> we have adults that don't adhere to the rules of the roadway. We're trying to get uh, youth to adhere to safety equipment and the right of way rules, which which it's difficult. But uh, our deputies are out there doing that. And uh, the traffic office will also be out and doing enforcement. It will not be an education period. It will be writing citations and that kind of that form. Well, for any citizens that are, you know, concerned and are listening to this meeting, it's want them to know that uh, the sheriff's department, starting with uh, Chief Manhart, they gave an outstanding quick response to their concerns, and uh, you should certainly be applauded for that. Oh, you want me to applaud? <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Nick, I can't hear you. Oh. There you go. Uh, Chief Manhart, do you have a bike patrol? Um, we do have bike patrol, um, but it's an ancillary duty. So it's all on overtime. Um, the deputies that are trained uh, for bike patrol, because there's a class that you have to go to, uh, I offer that up to them to uh, work on the opposite side of the week um, when they want to do that. So yes, but I do not have, it's not a full-time uh, assignment, um, but I do have the ability to have the deputies go out there on overtime. Okay, my question is more of um, uh, logistics as far as uh, do you uh, provide them just a regular bicycle or do you have an e-bike to keep? Uh, the city last year bought, we have two patrol e-bikes. Oh, good, 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 because that's, yeah, there's no way to, to pedal fast enough to keep up with these. <laughs> <laughs> good point. Without. Yeah, no, they're my spikes. Good, good. Take care of that one. Thank you. Tim, I have a question. Gary here. Um, uh, you said you're going to have an enforcement team come out. And uh, are they going to be enforcing all the California laws? Because uh, I know that uh, I believe that uh, on type uh, three bikes and higher, you're required to be uh, at least on type three electric bikes, you're required to uh, be 16 years of age. Is that going to be one of the ones enforced? So the traffic office is coming out doing specific enforcement. So with that, uh, Rick did a good job passing out that bike safety, the cheat sheet. Um, there's some challenges. So you have the, the level three bikes that you have to be 16 years older. Well, here, here's my question with that is uh, how do you identify that? So it doesn't give you the ability just to pull over anybody to say, let me see a bike. So like for motorcycles, motorcycles are easily identified that have over 250 cc's that could be on the freeway, that could be on major roadways that we can, we can identify that. Um, these bikes that have the three different levels, um, it's not easily identifiable. So as far as just pulling people over just to verify that, I'm telling you that's not going to happen. We are not going to stop people and decide. I just want to see what kind of bicycle you have. Uh, that would not be the primary uh, reason for pulling them over. However, if they are pulled over for not wearing safety equipment or riding unsafe or, or violating the vehicle code, if it's determined at that point after inspecting the bike that it is a level three and they're under the age of 16, well, that, that, could, that will be enforced as well. But that would absolutely not be the primary reason for stopping any individual. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, we have two different things going on here. We have the, like uh, Jessica said about the holistic approach to everything. And that's also true. But we have a real problem on the, on the trail right now. And I think we all know it. We've known it for quite a while. E-bikes are a great product. They're here to stay. There's, there's so much fun for kids and also adults. You know, and I get that 100%. But um, that trail is a problem right now. If we are a public safety committee, it's not up to us to decide if it's gonna be uh, it, uh, enforced by, oh, slow, we're gonna put uh, speed limit signs or, and what's gonna be impossible for anyone to enforce. 
um, we're going to have to come up as a public safety committee and decide collectively, hey, are these safe on our on our on our trail? And I think all of us need to um, come up with a yes or no um, and let the council decide on this, because um, from what I'm seeing um, and I'm not sure if the city will be liable if something happens or not, uh, we're going to have to ask the city attorney of that. But I think the quicker we come up with a decision and uh, say, hey, maybe we shouldn't have these things on a trail. Um, that's what these people are looking for. Yeah, I, I agree 100% with Joe. I, I, I listened to the council meeting and I, they were, I know they're trying to find a quick solution. However, sending it to one committee in two months to come back to another committee in three months, I'm, I'm not sure was the, what really the council was hoping for. Uh, it, it seemed to me, as far as e-bikes in the entire city, that, that's a long-term thing. That's gonna take some time to figure out. But as you can see by those comments, there is a real emergency on the trail. And, and if this council wants to address that sooner or later, maybe Adam, you could take that back to the council. You, you could kind of summarize our comments on this and find out if they're really willing to wait months before looking at this, or if they want maybe a quicker resolution as it applies to the trail. Well, I think there, there might be two things going on right now. Uh, the one that the council deliberated on, or I shouldn't say deliberated on, but provided direction to staff on last time was related to the city's review of our policies about e-bikes. Um, that work is its own project that is, it's going to be done by um, the city's committees and commissions. The, the city council will ultimately um, approve or uh, or, or um, alter uh, the the proposed uh, draft policy or ordinance, whatever whatever is created. Um, and then there's the the other issues of you know the actual what's happening right now on the beach trails. Um, you know, I Lieutenant Manhart is here and can respond to what our opportunities are right now. To uh, to regulate these uh, these vehicles, um, however, as far as as changing policy, staff has already gotten our direction, um, and it, it's our effort. It's our it's our intent not to duplicate efforts by having multiple bodies simultaneously review the policy about one particular type of uh, vehicle at the same time. Um, it, things do take a little bit of time to develop. Um, but I can, I can tell you, I, you know, I will be in communication with Samantha Wiley, um, recreation manager to ensure that this is moving along as fast as it possibly can. Uh, I will relay all of the committee's concerns at this point. And, um, and if there is a, if there is a need, uh, to go back to the council earlier for some independent direction, uh, outside of the, of the, of the long-term the longer term policy amendments, um, you know, staff will, 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 will consider that and do so if necessary. At this time, I, I, I can't weigh in on it, but I, I, I understand where the committee's concerns are and I, I'm more than happy to relay those to the people that are working on this project. What do you think of this? Um, uh, the public safety, we're a committee that's supposed to bring up things like this and they're supposed to get to the council. So what if uh, we were to draft a letter um, um, and send it to council and maybe them to agendize this? Because this, this is a pretty important thing. I, Rod, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to uh, come in on this. I've been seeing a lot of the beat, uh, some of the lifeguard towers, a lot of the kids parking their e-bikes down there while they go surfing. And the more and more e-bikes we're gonna be getting here, we're, we're gonna be packed down there. And, and it's, it's just not a safe thing. And I think we all agree with that. And whether the council is going to want to, you know, not have bikes and e-bikes on the beach, well, that's going to be their decision. But it's our, it's, it's our responsibility to let them know about things, especially we have so many people coming here and telling us about this. So uh, what's your thoughts down there, Rob, about all the ones on the trail? Uh, Joe, thanks for the question. Yeah, it's definitely increased uh, the popularity of the e-bikes and, you know, you're always going to have a a small percentage that's, you know, 
not going to abide by the rules and whatnot. Um, as far as enforcement for lifeguards, it's nearly impossible for us uh, to make contact. Usually, if it's a, a speed issue, we don't really have a mechanism to tell us um, if they truly are going over 10 miles an hour. I mean, it may look like it, but there's not a chance of us catching up to them and running someone over to make contact. We can make a PA and ask them to slow down. Um, but uh, as far as enforcement, um, we did issue our first citation, uh, I think it was last week, to an e-biker who obviously knew the rules. Um, he was on the pier. He walked. Um, the lifeguard went out on the pier deck to go talk to the individual. Um, he got off his bike and walked before he made contact. And then uh, as he walked, the guard went back in the tower. And the uh, subject got on his bike and sped to the, towards the end of the pier. And nearly uh, knocked over an elderly lady. Um, and she ran down, and, or her, her daughter ran down and complained and went up to the pier tower. And the guard went down and made contact and you know, did education efforts, but ultimately ended up in uh, administration citation for the individual. Well, I, I, I appreciate the lifeguard's due diligence for, for in, enforcing that, but there's another reason the lifeguard shouldn't be enforcing e-bike rules on the pier anywhere else. That distracts them from what they're primarily responsible for, which is water safety. So this is another reason why, why it's really important if we're taxing other resources for doing this, uh, doesn't make much sense. And I, I like Joe's idea. Uh, we're supposed to be responsive to the council, but also the council would agree that we all have to be respons responsive to the public. And it seems like by the number of letters to this new committee that it's very, very important to the public. And if nothing else, I like the I Joe's idea of just signing off a quick letter that says, as a committee, we think this, this is really, really important. And however it's facilitated, it should be facilitated quickly. One more question for uh, Ed and, and for you uh, ex-police officers. Um, don't you agree that it probably would be easier just to enforce no bikes on uh, no e-bikes on the trail or no bikes on a trail as far as trying to let uh, come up with speed limits and where to walk and everything else i mean i think it would be just about impossible to to try and enforce speed limits and you know walking on the bridge or this and that but would it be much easier just to enforce it no bikes on the trails well um my this is, this is, is real fast this isn't my area of expertise but um, you're going to have to inquire the the purpose, if I remember correctly, about having that trail from North Beach all the way down was to keep traffic off of El Camino Real. And I believe that, this, that the city received funds for designing that beach trail. And I'm not sure, but there might have been some stipulations in there about uh, pedestrian and bicycle traffic going through there to keep off of El Camino Real. And so if that wording is in there, uh, and I'm not part of that, but um, this, this whole conversation is gonna be mute because uh, it was designed to keep the, the, the bike and, and pedestrian traffic off of El Camino Real and if we receive funds for that, um, it, my recommendation would be to contact uh, the city to find out what the terms were in that money. And um, if that's the case, then you're absolutely not gonna do this. And um, uh, I understand what you're saying about getting them off, but, but <laughs> I'll tell you what, I would rather have bikes on, on the bike path than on El Camino Real. Yeah, so, well, maybe we can we can just ban pedestrians. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you can do that either. I don't think so. But those okay, are some questions. I don't want to lose this thing. Uh, my perspective on the thing is how are you going to enforce it if you if you have it? You know, no bikes at all. Well, who's going to stand there and, and say yes, no, yes, no? That's the other big thing is who's going to enforce this thing because if it's unenforceable, it is it's not a rule. Okay. Yeah. So well, the, thought in it. well, I I, yeah. I, okay. I, I, I mean, but with, with regulation comes responsibility of enforcement, unfortunately. And if you just hang up signs and do, do whatever, if you don't enforce it, then you do have liability when there's a problem. So it's, it, and to 
Chief Manhart's point, I, I understand that, but I'm not sure e-bikes, when that when we got the funds and built that trail, I'm not even sure e-bikes were around. Well, oh, no, and, and, I, and I get that, but here, just to throw a wrench in this, make sure this we're going down the rabbit hole on this. So if you had an e-bike and you got on the trail and then you turned off the e-bike motor and you're pedaling it like a bicycle, how, yeah. how, how can I enforce that? Uh, no, that, no, that's that's an excellent you know, point. And the city, the city has a trail all the way through it, all, Ola Vista and all the way through the city that you don't have to ride on El Camino Real. That's, and I try and stay off it and you go all the way to to Dana Point and all the way to, to Christian Edos, and you don't have to ride on El Camino Real. So I think we need to find out, like you said, Ed, about that. But um, I, 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 I think we'd be remiss if we didn't um, write a, a letter to council explaining this problem. I um, mean, I don't see a big problem with, with having uh, no e-bikes on that trail. You know, I, uh, uh, I monitored that uh, city council meeting that, uh, uh, they decided to take our two committees and give it this item to it. And I, I heard their frustration because they had a, just a ton of public comments and complaints regarding this. And that's why this came up. So now all of a sudden we're stuck with looking at all this stuff too. So. Well, th th to simplify, I, I still like Joe's idea. The short comment from this committee it says we, we, we feel that with the public's comments taken into to account, that this should be something that should be looked at fast tracked or whatever between whatever committee. I think it's a public safety thing, but if they think it's a beaches thing, then that's fine. But it needs to be looked at sooner than later. And, I'll, and I'll, draft, I'll draft a letter and I'll send it to everyone and to Adam. And then, uh, and then we could go from there. Yeah, without making any specific recommendations, just the fact that it needs to be fast tracked, no matter how they decide to do it. We need a motion for that, Adam, that I draft a letter. Gary's got something. Oh. Yeah, uh, right. I want to squeeze. I want to squeeze well, in there. <laughs> um, I think that I'm, I'm not just, sure. I'm not sure if you can make a motion to send a letter at this meeting. I, I think you may need to make a motion to agendize this for the next meeting. But if you wanna make a motion and and I'll, I'll confirm with the city clerk, if it can't happen, I'll, I can, at, you know, if you, if you can't at the same meeting uh, um, propose and approve writing a letter, um, then I'll, I'll agendize it for the next meeting so that it's something that can be voted on. And in the meantime, you can draft the letter. Um, and I can tell you at this point, it's clear that, um, you know, I will be making some uh, updates as this moves through the city's uh, process. I, I'll make those updates during the, um, the, uh, the reports at the end of the meeting. Um, uh, but I, yeah, yeah, definitely we're going to have to you know, stay up to date on where the Beaches Parks and Recreation Commission is on this. Um, and in the meantime, I, I understand your need for the, you know, for the letter. I, I, you know, I, I, I can tell you from watching the last council meeting that it, clearly the council is, is, um, is concerned with this. And, and I, on behalf of staff, will tell you that we're not going to delay this, uh, at, at, you know, any more than absolutely necessary. The dates that I was providing are just what was in the Beaches, Parks and Recreation uh, Commission's work plan for that particular project. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm at this point unable to provide you with uh, specific dates about when it will return. I can tell you, I, I'm going to speak with Samantha Wiley on Thursday about this topic. And so it may, it may very well be moving uh, much ahead of schedule as far as what the work plan uh, described. We cut off Gary though. <laughs> Thank Gary, you. Go ahead, Gary. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I, I think we'd be uh, a little bit myopic if we only focused on the beach trail. And I think uh, there were some letters that indicated uh, some other pedestrian walkways. And I think perhaps in taking into uh, consideration the comments that Lieutenant Manhart said uh, that uh, perhaps we wouldn't be able to do something because of the funds, the way the funds were gathered and stuff. But let's say they're not. Um, I would say that uh, the city 
maybe start designating uh, bleach trails and such as, as such as pedestrian uh, thoroughfares, walkways, and prohibit uh, e-bikes from this. I would actually like to see uh, uh, a uh, oh municipal code uh, that would prohibit riding on bikes on the sidewalks altogether, not just e-bikes, but all bikes on sidewalks. And uh, these are the areas that I think uh, are the endangerment areas is uh, e-bikes on sidewalks, e-bikes on uh, pedestrian walkways. So I think it should be a little bit broader than just uh, aiming right at the beach trail. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I, I think the, the council's main or priority was the beach trail only because of the the, the situation on the beach trail. But I, I think definitely the, the we should look at the regulation in the entirety uh, because like say half the comments talks about not about the beach trail about you know other other parts of the city so that definitely should be part of the art part of the discussion well i think uh what we're addressing right now is is moving it a little faster than dragging yeah. on and on and on and on because there's you know the the citizens are are interested in some sort of a resolution on this thing because they uh they see a public safety problem and uh and the city council sees it also it's you know i you know i i i'd like to grab it and do something with it but there's these procedures going on and it's given to the beaches parks and rec first and so i uh adam i don't know what to tell you that uh you know we need to um try to expedite this thing i i believe well, I, i'd like to make i'd like to make a motion i, I move that we agendize the sending of a letter communication to the council regarding the uh, e-bike issue. Uh, part of that motion will be that uh, in anticipation of that being on the agenda that Joe Janice draft a, a, a letter for presentation during the next meeting. And that if, uh, uh, if it looks right that we, that, well, well I'll, I'll leave my mission, I'll leave my motion there that he, draft a letter in anticipation, and we agendize the, the possibility of sending a letter to council for the next meeting. And that's regarding specifically, is it just the beach trail or is it all the e-bike things? I'll, I'll just say it's e-bike safety. I'll just say that, and then we'll, we'll take a look at how the letter comes out. All right, so it's been moved. Any second? I like to discuss that. <laughs> well, you know, it, and, and the reason is, I agree that we have to go um, do a lot more. And there are so many good um, suggestions, like going to the schools and, and education stuff. That's going to take a lot of stuff, right? Yep. And so and if we try and put that all together, we might have a pretty hard time. If we li limit this letter to just the beach trail as, as a recommendation from Public Safety Committee to the Parks and Rec, and to the council, um, I think that's what would, would make a little more sense to me right now. Because it would be very difficult to draft a letter um, putting all that stuff in. I, I, I agree, I'll amend my motion to the uh, drafting the letter to be uh, specifically for e-bikes on the beach trail. All right, do we have a second? I'm waiting for a second. I'll second it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's been moved and second on this uh, uh, letter asking for uh, a little bit uh, faster work on specifically the beach trail and e-bikes. Um, let's see, I'm going to go for Vice Chair Janice. Aye. Um, Rick? Aye. Gary? Gary, how do you feel? Uh, I'm going to vote nay because I still think we need to include uh, sidewalks and uh, walkways. And I think it's, I, I just believe we're, like I say, just focusing on one little narrow subject. And I think it's uh, a little bit broader than that. And I think they can easily do it. So. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm going to vote yes. Um, just to get this thing moving along. I I'll see what uh, city council and the, the beaches of park uh, have a, uh, a say in this too, but uh, at least it 
it shows that we're interested in moving this along too. And, and then it'll go over to, uh, it, at least my concern, it'll go over to address everything else in the city, all the trails and sidewalks and everything else. But uh, the, the trail is the, the big thing right now. Okay, Adam, you, clear on that one. Mostly, I just want to point of clarification. Sure. Um, and I apologize for um, for missing it if it was there. Did the motion include having uh, Vice Chair Janice draft a letter and send it to the council if possible? It's mm -hmm. to draft a letter only, agendize it for the next meeting, right. the committee can review it, and then vote on sending it. That was the motion. Perfect. <clears throat> Yeah, you, you don't want to send it before it's uh, voted on. Very good. Okay. Let's see, we have the date here. Okay. Mr. Atanian, the next um, thing is a minute's approval for October 7th. Everybody get a chance to look over the minutes from that meeting? Yes, so the draft minutes were provided. Uh, if there are no um, uh, recommended alterations to these minutes, then I will need a motion by the committee to adopt them, to, excuse me, to approve them. Uh, I make a motion to, for approval. Make a motion we adopted in the last meeting. I'll second. All right. Um, let's see, uh, Vice Chair Janice. Hi. Okay, Rick. Hi. Gary. Gary, are you uh, good with your motion? <laughs> aye. Good, and it's aye for me. Aye. Pro. Thank you. All right, the uh, next thing is uh, oral and written communications, I guess. Adam, do you have anything on that? I do not have any uh, comments submitted for the oral communications portion of this meeting. Okay, good. Uh, the next item is reviews and recommendations, uh, contract police services performance measures. I have, um, it, do you wanna preface this, uh, Adam? This one here on the uh, Yeah, services. thank you, Chair Vercuta. So this item, um, is a continue is essentially a continuation of the last uh, the last meetings uh, reviews and recommendations section. We had uh, scheduled to have uh, Captain Malat uh, do a presentation last time, and so we provided the marine safety uh, performance measures uh, from the last two years for that meeting. Uh, we also anticipated uh, that. Uh, Lieutenant Manhart would be with us, uh, but due to uh, issues beyond their control, uh, they were not able to uh, participate in the last meeting. So the their portions of this uh, performance measure, I'll call it a review and introduction, uh, was was moved into this meeting, um, and so the. Uh, Fiscal year 18 and 19 performance measures for police services and marine safety services uh, are provided. And uh, in addition to that, Lieutenant Manhart has provided the, uh, the 2019 annual report that uh, is submitted to the uh, city uh, by the San Clemente Police Services. Um, uh, and so all of those things were provided for the committee's review and discussion. Uh, and then uh, just one note, uh, as, as we discussed at the last meeting, at this point in time, uh, it, the, the committee's, uh, the context of this review is really um, to be, to familiarize the com committee with the performance measures, uh, how they're developed, how they're reported, the frequency, things like that. Um, later in this meeting, we will be talking a bit more specifically about the work plan related to performance measure review. Uh, but at this point of the meeting, I think it's appropriate to uh, essentially uh, provide uh, Lieutenant Manhart and Captain Malott uh, with 
with a moment if they want to if they want to briefly give an overview of their performance measures uh, or ask any questions that they that, that the committee has. Uh, I just want to say on the uh, the end review, there's quite a bit of information in there. Um, if you guys have any information, it's I think it's very thorough and it's a good snapshot of everything that we provide, uh, not only for San Clemente Police Services, but OCSD. Um, and as far as stats go, as far as uh, part one and part two crimes, um, all that information should be in there. And I believe that should be sufficient. But if you guys have any questions, let me know. And if there's anything else that that's not in there, please also let me know. And uh, I will uh, track that down and get it for you guys. Okay, I've got a question. Um, and I'm trying to resolve uh, the city's performance measures, this form here that we received with the statistics that are reported in, in uh, Chief Manhart's uh, description and, uh, and the, the, the numbers are off. So I'm not sure how, how I'm reading this thing, but I can go page by page on the thing and I don't wanna do that now. I think uh, in our work uh, uh, program, uh, we, we, one of the work uh, things that we have is statistics, and I think we can pretty well move that together unless um, you, Chief Banard, have a, uh, understand that there's two different reporting things and it's reported two different ways, but the numbers don't come out the same as far as I see. Yeah, Nick, if, if uh, you know what, if you have questions, I'll tell you what, it'd probably be easier and for time management if I if I spoke to you and we'll go over whatever your questions were and I had to break it down. Great, yeah. And, and this is not the time to do it because uh, it's too, it's getting into minutia and that's what I need to do is to talk to you directly and say, hey, this is what I see. Am I looking at it wrong type thing? So yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Anyone else have a question regarding uh, uh, OCSD? And that report. Okay. Any other? Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I, I do have a question. I, I was muted. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we got the fire department's uh, number of alarms. Is that what they actually responded on? And I see for the uh, OCSD, they had like 27,488 calls um, last year. And I know, you know, you get a ton of calls coming in, but as far as officers responding to, to different ones, do I come up with that total by taking some of the other stuff like um, emergency calls and traffic collisions and number of arrests and parking violations, stuff like that? How do you, how do you come up with the actual, kind of number of uh, alarms you average going on per day. So you're talking about just alarms. So it's all broken down, but that 27,000, that's, that's everything. That's, those are calls for service. Those are proactive uh, uh, deputy actions. And, and most of the so it's, it's a, it's a combination, but if you're asking about how many alarms, I would have to break that down and have our, you don't do it, you don't do it like the fire does. I, 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 I can no. see why you don't. But I was, I was just kind of, I was just kind of trying to determine. You also had after there, you you had the the patrol statistics, and you had in 2017 we had 31,000 calls for service, and in 2019 there were 27,000, and then the preventative action since the calls were going down, I I would thought that uh, it would be inversely how the um, preventative time would go up, but it. It doesn't. It doesn't work that way. I thought you, maybe you could explain that to me because I I don't understand it. So the calls are calls are not necessarily related. I guess if you also looked at the crime stats, right? So call volume went down significantly. But if you notice that the crime stats, part one and part two, uh, they didn't change much. So um, if you're asking, ideally, if if the call volume dramatically reduces, it gives the deputies more time to be proactive. Um, but that's not always in a perfect world because see the 27,000 calls that you have there there's some calls that are very significant it'd be one call it could take up multiple deputies multiple hours and then we have other calls um that are very simple like what you're talking about alarm call that within 15 minutes we we arrive on scene and determine that it's a false alarm and we go on our way so there isn't a scientific 
uh, right. assumption assumption that hey listen you have this amount of calls and this is how much time you're going to have and, and and everything's different and every year is different um so for me to explain that to you i mean yeah. I, unfortunately i don't have the right math equation yeah well, maybe we'll get together sometime um so I, so I, I think that matrix report long ago talked a little bit about um preventative patrol time and uh, I just don't understand how that all gets tabulated. So maybe we'll talk about that sometime. Good. Let's see now. Any other questions for uh, Fred? I do have one more. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Um, response times. I think I read in the in the uh, uh, report, any report that we you average around four four and a half minutes per per response time. And is that um, from what, when the deputy gets the call from dispatch till the time he arrives on scene? So that, that under five minute, that's for priority one calls. So that's for, you know, significant uh, life-threatening uh, calls. And that is, that is our goal is once we receive the call, once the deputy is dispatched, we, we have an expectation that we want to, we want to be there in less than five minutes. Okay. Um, so that's, that's not, that's not all calls. So that's not report calls or, yeah. uh non-violent calls so but yes uh, that's that's when when the deputy receives the call well when dispatch uh sends the deputy that we wanted under five minutes got it got it and then i i went to the blotter and just kind of took kind of a random page and i noticed that um from receive time to dispatch time varies a lot so so when you get a real top priority, is it right to say that the dispatch time is, is pretty quick? And then if you get one that's not top priority, then the dispatch time is quite a bit longer? Well, so the priority is just that for the emergency calls, both us and for the fire department. Uh, when you call the emergency line, the first question they want to know is an emergency. And if it's not, if it's not they, they transition your phone call onto the non-emergency line to keep those lines open. So uh, then they're taken in um, in order of, of of threat. So we have like like priority two calls, which there might be some threat, and then we have priority three calls that it's a cold call that you know you lost your wallet, you want to report. Well, the, we're going to prioritize that, and that's what's going to happen. And, that, and that's what the dispatcher does then when she. That's was, that's correct. Okay. That's correct. All right. Good. Good. Gatekeeper. Right. Any other questions? at this point. Nope. Okay. It looks like uh, the next one is uh, for for marine safety. Uh, um, um, Rod, are you still there? Not a lot. You, are you, you're muted. Thanks, Nick. I'm here. Okay, how uh, I'm, you know, I just got a glimpse of that sunset. It's absolutely spectacular again. <laughs> you must be looking at it. Uh, I'm watching you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, geez. Okay. What a job. All right. Uh, questions for um, for marine safety stuff on the performance uh, measures. Any. Uh, any questions? Oh, I got one here. Um, you estimate, uh, you know, 2.3 million visitors. How do you, how do you uh, estimate that? Uh, it's based upon the, the time of year, um, weather conditions and crowd conditions. Um, we have an estimation uh, attendance table that we look at and, um, and base it upon that. So um, it's broken down into different months and off season to summer season, weekends versus weekdays, special events, holidays, and so forth. It's a, what you call is a very popular beach we have. Yes, it is. Yeah, boy, you got your work cut out for you. Thank you for being there. All right, I see a no. Let's uh, go to the next agenda item if we can. Um, we've got new business. We've got the implementation plan program that, uh, Adam, would you uh, care to introduce that one for us? Thank you, Chair Burkuda, members of the Public Safety Committee. The item before you is a uh, work, work plan implementation program uh, 
that uh, is uh, is designed to uh, effectively, or I should say, efficiently uh, organize the work plans uh, in terms of the uh, the assignments of duties, the uh, basic idea of the the totality of the work uh, for each work plan project, uh, as well as a uh, uh, time frame for the task uh, to help the committee work through this plan uh, over the next year. And I've uh, uh, provided a, an attachment that is a matrix of a, a proposed uh, program for this implementation uh, that includes uh, some alternatives uh, uh, for the committee's consideration. Uh, this is by no means the only way that these uh, these projects can be accomplished, um, but just based on staff's um, familiarity with these kinds of tasks, uh, it, uh, the proposed uh, recommendation before you now is is uh, a good example of of how things like this have been uh, accomplished in the past. So. Um, that's that's pretty much it. Um, there are, um, like I said, there are a number of implementation items here uh, to go over. If you'd like, I can answer any specific questions. Um, there are even in the proposed in staff's proposed implementation program. It's important to note that there are uh, many that in, uh, involve the assignment of duties to. Uh, one or two public safety committee members, and uh, that will that should be de decided. Um, yeah, now it could be done. Uh, this is something that we could decide um, in stages if the committee would like. I would like to get as much direction on this uh, work plan uh, implementation program as possible uh, to help with scheduling out the committee's time and the uh, gen uh, future agendas as possible. And I, you know, that's what we've been waiting for to, to get, actually do stuff. And this is the first part of this matrix is the first part of actually doing stuff. So uh, I, I propose uh, that uh, we broke ourselves down into, into two uh, two committeemen uh, on each one of these uh, when we wrote them up. Um, Adam, you did a heck of a job uh, stretching it out into this uh, database. Um, as far as the, like the individual ones, um, we could start off the top with communications of disaster preparedness. I'd like to uh, be on that uh, little subcommittee or working party on that. What do we call this, a working party or whatever we want to call it, I guess. Any term that the committee is comfortable with is, is fine with me. Um, it, it could be a, it could technically be a subcommittee um, as, as if, it's, if it's more than one committee member, but not a quorum. Anyway, um, Rick, uh, you and I wrote this thing up. Are you interested in uh, continuing on? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you could be the primary on it, Nick, and I'll, I'll tell you why. We've got to remind you that uh, Gary and I are also on the homeless subcommittee, which has just as extensive work plan. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to be secondary on as many as you want and primary is on few as I can, if you know what I'm saying. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever the primary want, needs me to do, but until until we get both work plans together, I'm not going to exactly know how much how much time it is. So I, I would love to be the secondary guy with you, Nick, on this, if, that, if I explain myself clearly. You don't have to explain anymore because of when I, I <laughs> program this thing out, I noticed that you're on four of the five or six. Of the <laughs> I don't know how you did it, but no, I uh, thank you for uh, helping. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know, I can uh, take the primary on that would be good. 
Um, and and I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, as I look down on the disaster preparedness, as it goes down the, the, the different, you know, topics here, and we need, you know, two and then alternate or whatever, is, it, is there any reason why Nick and I couldn't just carry this down through this one topic, since that's what we started with? That's absolutely possible. Um, just pro provide a little bit more background on how I developed this. The first, I, the first work plan project was communication and disaster preparedness, and it's it's a um, it has essentially four yeah it has it has four uh, goals in it that are um, a bit a bit more independent of one another. Than some of the other than some of the other work plan projects. So in in some of the the later ones in here, all of the goals are combined into essentially one line um, because they all they kind of play off of each other. These are independent enough where it could be possible for uh, different people to tackle different items. Uh, but the main reason why they're in, they're they're separated is because the task to accomplish them is is independent of of the other goals in this work plan project. So okay. if you and and um, Chairman Burkuta would like to take all of this as the as the as the designated two P, uh, public safety committee members, that that would be fine with me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at it, and they do. You know, it's kind of a cohesive component as we go through it. I think they both kind of, they all kind of blend together. So I would propose for simplicity that, that Nick and I are the, are the primary and maybe we put Joe and Gary down as the alternates or something just to, to cover those bases. That works for me. Um, since, um, since we go through it this way, I, I, I'll, I'll recommend that the committee essentially create a roster as you are right now and after each kind of decision point if, if maybe you want to take a straw poll um I, I i just want to make sure that okay that all the committee members are are in agreement as we go through this without having to take one vote at the very end and then okay. find out if anybody disagrees well, yeah, I, okay, in that case, I'd, I like don't think I have a, any, you know. I'd like to ask for a straw poll on this first measure on the communication disaster preparedness. If for the work plan that we designate Nick and I as the primary and Joe and Gary as the alternates. So I guess Nick calls for the straw poll, I or nay or yay. <laughs> now, I'm sorry, before that, as far as the alternate goes, um, are you are you saying that in case uh, one of the primary members is not able to fulfill that, that one of the other members steps in? Um, and, and the reason I'm asking is because it's not I, I don't know that that's necessary. We can always we can always designate the alternates in, in the event that that situation occurs. Oh, OK, well, then, then I'm going to. I'm going to change that to, to the straw poll that Nick, Nick and I take, take this box as the primary, the primary, I don't know, work plan workers. Perfect. So the only other question is, does anybody else want to, want to be oh. involved in this, this particular one? I mean, we're all going to have plenty to do. So I just don't want to limit that. Well, to you know, I, I think that some of our committees are going to kind of come together anyhow, because because your committee you're talking about right now is probably going to be quite involved with the neighborhood watch also that Rick and I are going to head up and I will be primary on that one, Rick. But right. so, um, so, yeah, we'll we'll massage this thing as we go. No doubt about it. Oh, yeah, there's plenty to do and there's plenty of uh, activities to, to do. And I, I'm sure we'll all work together uh, for one purpose and one goal. Okay. All right. Well, well, let's go ahead and call for the straw poll so we can get that part of that out of the way. If, if everybody's agreeable that you and I handle this uh, communication disaster preparedness, just ask for a straw poll and poll us. Okay. Let's see. Um, Gary, how do you feel? Yeah, I think that's good. Good. Joe? Aye. And uh, 
Gary? I mean, uh, Rick? I. <laughs> Rick, I. <laughs> yeah, Rick, I. And I'm, I'm great with it, too. But uh, um, shall we include um, um, the Chiefs here? No? No. Well, they want to be as far away from this as possible, trust me. <laughs> Work? Work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, Nick, you don't need a straw poll for that. Oh, Trust me. <laughs> I already knew what the answer was. I thought I didn't want to leave them just uh, here, you know? I think I see Chief Manhart kind of moonwalking backwards a little bit here. <laughs> oh, God. Okay. So we got that one done, right? Correct. So we go to the next one, which is uh, homeless? Not just yet. Oh, that is good. So that, that, that covered the assignment of those tasks. Right. In addition to those, there are, I, I proposed the actual tasks, and, and this is not the, a full description, but this is a, 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 a essentially a, a cliff notes about what, how to accomplish each task, and then it's got a task time frame on it. Uh, I'd like to get... A, I'd like to get a, a vote on that at some point in the meeting. Um, it doesn't, this doesn't, we don't need to do a straw poll on everything, but if, if along the way um, anybody does not um, or, or would like to propose a different task or task time frame, that, that should be brought up. Otherwise, at the very end, I'm going to be asking that the committee uh, approve staff's proposed tasks and task time frames. Right. I provided some alternates here. So there are there are there are some okay. other ways to go about it. Um, but the proposed one is is my recommended. Okay. So if we don't see anything that's a big conflict, we just don't say anything and we keep going through these and we vote at the end that the time frames are acceptable. Is that right? absolutely yeah okay. Yeah, I, I, as far as my concern on the first one here, communications and disaster preparedness, I don't see any problems on that. You know, you, you know, Rick, when the, not Rick, uh, all of us, um, Adam, when the uh, city council hired us, we were all <laughs> retirees. So it's not like we, we have a full-time job other than Joe. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Moving right along, do we need to talk any more on this this particular? This no, thing? I think we have everything we need for this one. Good job here. That's a lot of work you were doing there, Adam. Um, homeless and best management practices for public safety personnel. Um, I got Rick and Gary were uh, instrumental in writing that one up. I well, I, I think since we're on that homeless subcommittee, it probably makes sense that we stay with this one because there'll probably be a lot of overlap between the two gary what do you what do you think well i, I i'm uh, a little perplexed because uh on the proposal it was it uh, discusses that um, we're just going to um, essentially analyze how the sheriff's department uh, or any of our public safety uh handles um uh, the homeless and the issue here is a lot larger than that. So I just want to make sure that that's where, uh, for this particular work for, uh, plan, that's what they want us to do. And they want us to do it just for November to December. So in other words, we would just be examining what we can determine in November and then reporting in January, I guess. Is that correct? Uh well, it's it's October of twenty twenty one, isn't it? The deadline, right? Yeah, the deadline for the project is October twenty twenty one. In reviewing the actual project, uh, most of this is simply about assuring that our public safety personnel have the information that they need to appropriately make contact with. The homeless right i don't know that we need until october of 2021 no no we, we we can certainly do a quick but I mean, we have plenty of time is what i'm, I'm saying and yeah th this is specific to this task it's not about 
you know, like our homeless committee is, you know, the support of housing and the shelters. All, it's none of that. It's just specific to law enforcement, you know, resources. So I, I, I think it's going to be fairly, I'm not going to say easy to do, but it'll be pretty specific of what we have to do. Yes. So on this one, I, you know, I, I've, the proposed assignment here essentially is for the uh, the non-voting public safety committee members, um, which actually would, in this case, would uh, I would also have a play a part here, is to um, essentially provide information to the committee uh, discussing um, various aspects of, of our personnel's contacts with homelessness, uh, so that the committee is aware of, of how the city. Um, addresses the needs of the homeless in all in our contacts. Right. Another way to do it would be to have the have assigned two public safety committee members to investigate all of this, kind of figure out best practices. Um, and I, I well, I, I think we'll get it a little quicker if we have our own staff provide that information. I, I think it would work better if, if we have two of our committee members working with both chiefs and captain of marine safety, throwing the stuff back and forth. I just think it would just work out better that way. That way, if they have a question of the, you know, of committee members, we we're already involved in the same way with the with the OCSD and OCFD and marine safety. This seems like we ought to do it as a as a concert. And that makes perfect sense to me as well. And, and in that case, I, I'd still like to volunteer myself to be part of that. And if Gary wants to, that'd be great too. But if you know, somebody else wants to jump in, that's fine. Gary, how do you feel? Yeah, no, I'm I'm good with that. That uh, actually will be helpful for the uh, homeless subcommittee also. It, it, yeah, it will definitely, I've got a feeling that we will be part of that subcommittee on the homeless subcommittee as far as law enforcement goes, so. Okay. But we, at least we're covering it on that one. Do we, uh, are you looking, is everybody happy with that? Yes. Joe? Okay, good. I'm happy too. Uh, the next one is legislative review. And Gary, you handled that one as far as the write-up on that. Are you still uh, still uh, want to take the lead on that one? Yes. Uh, yes, I have a little background in it, so that helps. Um, but uh, also, I, I do think that uh, that will help with uh, our homeless situation also because there's laws and stuff and um so uh my proposal on that is uh to utilize some of our area representatives uh for the state senate uh and right on you know the county um board of supervisors and such because i, I think uh, the legislation and such that's that uh, will be needed to help with all that We'll go hand in gloves. So, Good. do you yeah. need a second on uh, a second person on your uh, little committee there? I don't think so because it's just like a single, you know, kind of context and getting information. It's really there's not a lot of uh, big research. Is they will just call you and tell you, hey, you know, you just uh, can get things on bills. Okay, here's a bill that's in committee, and you know, you review it and such. So yeah, and, I don't think uh, so at this time. I would suggest so maybe and if, if, if Nick's agreeable to this, since he has a lot of administrative experience also that maybe Nick be the alternate, just in case you need somebody to jump in or bounce something off of. I, like I said, I know, I know I was with you on this work plan, but I, I don't have virtually any experience in that. So I don't know, maybe like I say, maybe Nick could be the alternate on that if you needed some help. I certainly could, uh, but uh, I'll leave it to you, Gary, to say, hey, um, you know, if you want to run any, any of the things by me, it's, it's fine. Okay, no, I'll, I'll, 
how about we just put you down and uh, everything that I'm doing. Yeah, there, like there's a spot for an alternate that says all PSC members, but you know, if we just put Nick in there, like I say, he, he would be he would be the first choice, I think, if you needed something. Yeah. yeah. Um, just a, a clarification. The uh, the alternative is a separate proposal, uh, not, not a okay a secondary kind of assignment. Um, for the most part, the the assignments are I think a bit more obvious. The alternate and the proposed, though, they come into play later on, and and this is a kind of a good example of it. Uh, it, it appears like the committee wants to move forward with the assignment of this task to one person, that being um, committee member Walsh. Uh, however, the proposed task at hand is uh, essentially to use just the League of Cities public safety legislative updates um, as, uh, as, as how to review legislation potentially impacting the city. And I, I, I'm saying, I'm, I'm writing this down for ease of administration of this task. Uh, Committee Member Walsh was talking about uh, various sources. So in that case, the alternative task is the one we would want to go with. Uh, however, that one is going to be left up to Committee Member Walsh. Um, much more. He's going to need to go out and find all the sources that he wants to use is help in helping him do this legislative review. Whereas the city gets this League of California Cities legislative review, we, we're on a mailing list. So that we can easily provide. But if, if you want to use other sources, then it's just going to be up and it's going to be entirely up to the committee member to find those sources and acquire that information. The other one is that uh, if if Gary is uh, you know needs some help on the law enforcement end of them looking at the thing, I'm obviously I'm going to be uh, available for him. Okay, yes, and um, all of this information is going to be presented to the committee uh, on a regular basis. Um, the true. task is really just. A, is, is uh, pulling the information and doing a brief review and identifying what are the things that the committee needs to be made aware of and discuss for potential impacts to this provision of public safety. Um, so the way that the proposed task time frame is written, it's that during the legislative season, typically between January and August, we would include a placeholder on the public safety committee agenda for each meeting to discuss new legislation and current status of bills. So that's basically a place where uh, committee member Walsh will discuss all, you know, what, what's going on with this particular task. What are the things that, that, that the committee may need to be made aware of and, and discuss for potential impacts? Yeah. Okay. Super. Any, uh, anybody you want to, discuss any more on legislative. Gary, you got this one. Okay, I, I'm actually, I was uh, I was gonna include you as the uh, you know, co on that. And then uh, like uh, Rick suggested, I could uh, you know, <laughs> suggest you to review some of it. Yeah, that's not a problem. <clears throat> yeah, happy to, happy to help. Um, let's go to Neighborhood Watch. Uh, Joe and Rick are the ones that authored that one. I, yeah, I, I, I'd like to stay on that with Joe. You know, and I'll take the primary on that if you want, Rick, since you're in so many committees. That'll be fine. Sure. Well, I, I plan on putting a lot of work on this. I think this is a good one. We're going to jump right in. So you can be the primary, but I'm, I'm right there with you on this one. Good, good. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff on that one available, and we can help out in the community and and see how we can uh, work on that one. Any uh, Gary, any any heartburn with uh, that uh, assignment? No. Good, right? no. <laughs> no. 
Uh, well, you're talking about uh, neighborhood watch, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm I'm good with that. Okay. Then we're into statistical information and review. Joe and Rick um, were authors on that one. How we feel on that one? Still good. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm good with that one still. I, I mean, looking at it, there's a lot of, you know, staff and a lot of, you know, OCSD uh, participation and OCS. So, yeah, but I, I'm, I'm definitely good on that one. Okay. Yeah, that works for me also. Good. Because I think we can do some real good on that one, too. <clears throat> a lot of data out there and try to figure out what it all means. <laughs> um. <laughs> Let's go to the next one. And the last one is technology review. Uh, Gary and I uh, were authors on that one. Um, Gary, you still good on this one? I think you're muted. Hit him a lot. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Are you muted? I muted myself. I'm sorry. I, muted. Uh, I have to say, in all candor, that uh, I may have my plate pretty full just with the other things that I'm doing. So okay. um, that's fine. Let me uh, let me take it and uh, see how far I can go on this and uh, see how big of a problem it is. It may be huge. Um, there's a lot of information out there, and uh, I know. Uh, Chief Manhart's uh, already made a couple of recommendations, and I'm sure that uh, Chief Capabianco is, uh, has other fire service stuff that uh, could be looked at also. So, uh, and, and as Adam brought up earlier, you, you know, we, we, we can all be secondary on all, all these. If you come up and you need some help between the other three of us, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we can help out. <laughs> Great. Uh, Mr. Uh, <coughs> motion to, to move any of this on this, or is it just uh, just do it? Well, I, I, I'll move that we accept the work plan matrix uh, as presented, and we also accept the time frames as presented to move our uh, work plan forward. Good. Any second? I second. Moved in second. Did we uh, move along with this stuff? Call for a vote. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Janice? Aye. Um, Committee Loeffler? Aye. Committee Wald? Aye. Good. And it's aye for me? Good job. Okay. All right. The next thing on the agenda is determination of the next public safety special meeting. Now, Adam, the special meeting, because the one following would be a, a regular meeting we're going to set up. How's that work? The next meeting is a special meeting because the uh, staff has not had an opportunity to take a, uh, an ordinance to the city council for adoption, uh, uh, creating the public safety committee as a regular standing committee. So it's going, to be, it's going to be standing until that occurs. Right now we're slated um, for the December 15th meeting. Um, and that's due to a number of uh, large council meetings um, that have, uh, that are kind of pushing some of our items back a little bit. Uh, that's the first meeting we can get on. So um, once that occurs, then uh, we'll be having regular meetings after that. As part of this agenda item, however, okay, as part of this item, um, I also uh, am requesting the committee to determine the preferred monthly date and time for regular meetings of the Public Safety Committee for future planning purposes. Um, we just for simplicity's sake, we can hopefully um, uh, schedule the special meetings um, until their regular meetings at the same time, uh, just to develop that consistency. Um, and looking at the calendar, the uh, fourth Tuesday of the month 
is is it is generally always available. Uh, if that works for the committee, uh, great. If not, I I've got the calendar open and we can figure mm -hmm. out some other uh, generally open times. All right. Uh, I want to make sure that it uh, it's uh, a good time, date uh, and time for for all of us. It's going to be bad for somebody here. So it's uh, good. Well, well, the fourth Tuesday in December is going to be right around Christmas, I'm, I'm guessing. So well, that would mean we'd be putting over two and a half months before another meeting. That would be up to the committee. Um, there, oh. there are other meetings that can be scheduled in the week, in the, the, the week of Christmas. Well, in the long term, the fourth of Tuesday might be great for, for the next special meeting. I was thinking maybe we might want to try to meet the middle of December just so we can keep the momentum going on this. And then after that, if we decide the four Tuesdays after that, that, that that's fine. But I just, I, I hate to go, you know, a couple of months without a meeting at, at this time, personally. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fine if that's what everybody else wants to do because we can still work within our committees. But, uh, uh, well, that, that, that's what I'm thinking. I, I was hoping for something in mid-December before you know, a bit before Christmas. Well, uh, uh, Adam, is there a, a problem with the, uh, say the 15th? It's a Tuesday. That's a city council meeting day. Um, it's not that we can't do it on that day, but I would recommend that we start it earlier uh, than 3 p.m. Oh yeah, I, you betcha. Um, well, is that Tuesday okay if we start at um, one o'clock in the afternoon, or is that pushing everybody too much? Does that push you a lot, Adam? I mean, you got you, that's a pretty busy day for you. Um, actually, uh, I, have, I have a hearing that day uh, that's going to be at ten a.m. and may may go into one. Uh, so that's that's not my my preferred day. Um, well, how about the seventeenth, like a Thursday? Of course, that that goes into yeah. something else too. There's another city meeting at three p.m. on that Thursday. Um, I believe that Thursdays are not the best days for our for 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 some of our other uh, committee members. Lieutenant Manhart, is that? Do you have conflicts on Thursdays generally? Oh, um, Thursdays are usually pretty good for me. Okay. Thursday, I'm, I'm the one with a Thursday afternoon problem. Thursday afternoons, uh, I have a standing meeting. Uh, um, so if you were to do one meeting, maybe I, I wouldn't be able to attend to that one. Um, Thursday, it would, uh, Thursday the 17th would have to be a, uh, probably a morning meeting, something around 10, 10 or 11. Thursday morning would work for me. I can do that. All right. How about uh, Captain Malott? Yeah, Thursdays are good for me as well. Boy. Okay, I'm I'm good. I'm well too. Anybody have a problem? Adam, do you have a problem? <laughs> Thursday that, that Thursday looks good for me. In the morning, right? Yes, I would recommend ten or eleven. Uh, probably ten a.m. would be. Uh, the best time. I think so too. Any, uh, any problems with anyone? Boy, I can't believe and, it. And what date is that again? 17th of okay. December, 10 a.m. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, okay, the other part of this discussion is uh, what would be a good consistent date for um, a set meeting um, when we finally get the uh, ordinance that uh, we can have a, we don't have to do special meetings. Uh, yeah, Chairman, can I go, go ahead and make the motion that we schedule the, our next meeting for the, the, the 17th and get that out of the way first? Okay, good. So, so I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll move that our next uh, special meeting of the Public Safety Committee be held on Thursday. December 17th at 10 a.m. 
Any seconds? I'll second it. Um, let's go for a, the vote, uh, Vice Chair Janice. Aye. Um, Chair, uh, Committeeman Loeffler. Aye. Committeeman Walsh. Aye. And I for me, that's 4 0. We're on. All right. Next, next thing is the is what's a good date? You, you were Adam. You were talking about a uh, the fourth Tuesday of every month. Yes, the four, uh, that fourth Tuesday of every month is a date that no other meetings are scheduled for. Um, what time would that be? I was anticipating 3 p.m. just because that's been our, our usual start time, but the, the meeting can be at any time. It's whatever's up. It's whatever the um, works best for the committee and, and all of its members. Well, let's let, let's check with the two chiefs and the and the captain first to see if that's an issue. No issue here. I'm good with it. No issue. Okay. That, I'm good with it too. <laughs> All right now, is um, would it be better rather than having these things extend out, um, start an hour earlier, like two o'clock in the afternoon? <clears throat> Any fine? Because I, I hate to have drag these guys sitting around till six o'clock or whatever, you know, type thing. Yeah. Well, well, hopefully this is one of the longest meetings we'll ever have. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, the motion is to have um, the standing meeting the fourth Tuesday of the month at two o'clock in the afternoon. A month. I'll later. second. Okay. Um, Wait, Mrs. Janice was coming in there. Has she got a problem with that fourth Tuesday, Joe? <laughs> this is Georgia. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Vice Chair Janice, how do you say? Uh, aye. Okay. Committeeman Loeffler? Aye. Committeeman Walsh? Aye. And aye for me. And for clarification, that will start in January, is that correct? Well, it depends on when it's, uh, we'll... It, uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, in January, that should not be a problem to have that meeting be on that date. Whether we're, uh, yeah, I think what... The, the problem with ordinances is, is that they become effective 30 days after adoption and then there's a, like a second reading, but we can at least have the meetings on that date. They may still be considered a special meeting, um, but we'll get these to be regular meetings as soon as possible. Hey, Nick, I wanted to clarify uh, the next meeting in uh, December. Is that going to be at 2? We're going to do that at 10 o'clock, right? It's at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, okay, great. Just wanted to make sure. Good job. Okay. Any, uh, we're all good. Any unfinished business at this point? See none. Now we're into reports of the committee members and staff. Now we got police services. Ed, we haven't talked to you in a couple of months. Now I got your mouth full. Ah. <laughs> uh, hey, just, uh, I'll keep it quick, but uh, we've been extremely busy in the past 24 hours. Um, we've had a vehicle pursuit. Stolen vehicle that was uh, taken from our city that uh, we recovered in uh, San Juan Capistrano. Uh, you guys probably saw Duke flying over yesterday. We had missing persons uh, that we located. Um, investigations, we had an assault where the investigators uh, located the suspect. He was arrested and we got four guns off the street. And this is all in the past 24 hours. So needless to say, we're in the winter time, but um, we are still extremely busy. Um, one thing I'd like to get out there in the community, we're coming up on the holiday season. If we can please pass on the message to everybody, do not leave any valuables in your vehicles, whether you're shopping, whether you're at home, parked in front of your residence, please remove everything. So uh, therefore the uh, suspects, the uh, thieves won't break into your vehicles and take your personal property. And make sure you lock the car anyway. Right. I got a couple of questions uh, on status of the city hall station and the outlet station. Yeah, so the, uh, the, I've had a couple of questions about that, about the outlets. We've been there for the uh, past couple months. So we have a satellite station that's operational there for the units on the 
west side of the freeway. Um, so they're already operational out of there. Um, and then currently right now, our station for here uh, downstairs is out for bid. And I was told by uh, next city council meeting, they're gonna award that bid, uh, that contract to whoever uh, receives it. And then hopefully in December, begin construction. So the, the goal is hopefully here in four months or so, knock on wood, if everything goes well, uh, we will move all of our resources from Aliso Via Hill uh, and all come out of this uh, building here at 910 Cayenne Show. So. Good job. Good job. Okay. Any other questions for uh, OCSD? Chief Manhart, I have a question. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, yeah. Chief Manhart, uh, is there a projected time for the uh, report on the fatal shooting to be published? Well, that would have to come through. Uh, the district attorney. So the, the sheriff's department's not the district attorney does an independent investigation on that. So you would have to contact them uh, to get that. I so haven't given you any indication on that. Uh, you know, I don't I don't know how long uh, those those take a long time. My guess uh, would probably be about a year. Um, but you would have to contact the, uh, the, the district attorney. They they work separate from us. So therefore it's, it's an independent review. Uh, it's not the sheriff's department investigating. Right. Just a, a basic inquiry about the health and uh, uh, welfare of the two deputies involved. How are they doing? They're, they're doing well, then they're back to work. Good, good. That's a traumatic situation. So they're victims too. Okay, um, let's go to uh, fire services. Chief, happy Bianco. Well, we had a little bit of a busy couple of weeks as well. Um, we had a couple of fires on um, was it Monday the 26th. So um, if you look at those two fires, we've had uh, in those areas, we've had historic fires. Back in 2007, we had the Santiago fire, uh, burned 17 homes and uh, nine other outbuildings. Um, in 2008, we had the freeway fire or the complex that burned um, 25 mm -hmm. close uh, over over 20,000 acres. 314 homes were destroyed. That was the one that burnt right on the 91 freeway. Of that Santiago fire in 20, 2007, uh, it was very close to the same origin as the uh, Silverado fire that we just had. So at 6:30 in the morning, we were dispatched to the Silverado fire. Uh, very close um, proximity to the San Diego fire and very similar offshore uh, strong red flag conditions. Uh, at uh, 1.30 in the afternoon, um, very close to where the freeway fire was, we were dispatched to the Blue Ridge fire. Uh, very similar conditions. Um, I'm still looking forward to seeing a map with the footprints of those two fires to see how similar they were. Um, back in 07 and 08, our resources were stretched thin with both of those fires. And on the 26th, we had both those fires in the same day. Uh, we had a, a tremendous amount of success um, with uh, the Silverado fire, which is where I was. We had no homes uh, destroyed. The Blue Ridge fire, there was one home um, heavily damaged, uh, no other homes destroyed. We did have um, a tragic accident on the Silverado fire with two of our firefighters were critically injured. They are still both in the hospital um, and fighting. Their families are, are uh, alongside of them and they've got a, a road ahead of them, that's for sure. Um, a couple other successes with uh, those fires and lessons learned from the previous fire. Uh, one of our biggest areas of success and why I wanna bring this up to you as a group um, is the importance of the fire code and our building codes and the updates that we get, uh, the fuel uh, fuels management programs, fuel modifications, defensible space. A lot of our success on both of those fires had to do with uh, the work our fire prevention has done over the last 20 years. Um, at some point, if, uh, if somebody would like to go out and, and uh, tour some of those fires, I can show you some of our success and show you the benefits and the successes that um, those fuel fuel breaks, fuel modifications had and allowed us to be successful, allowed us to deploy our resources a much wider area. Um, San Clemente obviously has some of the 
similar threats with the back country and the uh, coastal canyons that you have. Um, every year we, we continue to, um, I guess, be challenged with, you know, the, 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 there's a cost to, to the fire prevention and the fuel modifications. And so every year we get challenged and the support um, and the, that, that we get from San Clemente has always been great with uh, the importance of maintaining those fuel breaks, the fuel mods, and, and allowing us some uh, chance to be successful. The other big su success that we had, um, this fire hit, if there ever is a good time, um, this fire hit about an hour before our shift change. So an hour, an hour after the fire started, we had a, a whole nother um, uh, crew of firefighters that have, had come in. So uh, we have 77 fire stations. During these two fires, we had 61 of our engines on these fires out of 77 stations. Within four hours, we were still able to upstaff our relief engines, our reserve engines, our extra engines, and all of our staff, all of our stations were staffed again within four hours. So to be able to dump the resources that we dumped on these um, that early into the fire and still be able to run our 450 calls that we ran that day um, outside of this fire is, uh, is another very big success. Uh, we normally, for OCFA, we normally have about 400 firefighters on a day. Um, at the peak of this fire, we had 1,400 firefighters in Orange County. So that's the mutual aid system in, in, uh, um, in action. As far as the mutual aid goes, you know, we, uh, we, all, we all pay into it. We all, uh, on, on smaller, and when I say pay into it, we all share resources um, on a daily basis. Early in the season, we had Orange County fire engines and overhead up north, um, helping them with their fires. And then when it comes to this time of year is when a lot of the Northern California fire departments come down to help us. Um, like I said, we had 61 of our fire engines uh, on this fire. In total, uh, uh, on, on day two, we had 435 total fire engines from across the state of California fighting these fires. Um, once again, that allows us to continue to, to uh, operate on a daily basis, run our medical aids, run our, um, our falls, our traffic accidents. Uh, I don't have the stats in front of us, but um, the numbers that our, our dispatch center received were incredible yet still 99% of those calls were answered in 40 seconds or less. So some of those incredible stats, once again, they were at a shift change as well. And so they had double staffing. Um, so the fire, the, the timing of the fire did help us. Um, as far as the mutual aid goes, you know, we, like I said, we, we had fire, um, just a small, small uh, account as to where some of these came from. San Luis Obispo, Reno, Modoc, Lassen County, Fresno, Idlewild, Cala Mesa. Um, our, fee, our fire chief has also done something else. Um, Cal, uh, the Cal OES uh, is the one that manages the mutual aid system. Uh, all fire departments uh, offer support to it. Um, our fire chief in the last year um, has partnered with LA City, LA County and Ventura County to go um, one step beyond where uh, Southern California has some of the densest fire, fire resources anywhere in the world. And um, although it's extremely efficient, the mutual aid system does take some time from when somebody at the back of a suburban in the middle of San Diego Canyon orders 15 strike teams. Um, it, it takes some time for that, to, for that to actually show up on scene. What these four fire chiefs have done is, as some of the largest fire departments in Southern California is they've made an agreement that we're still gonna follow uh, fire scope. We're still gonna follow the mutual aid system, but it's all gonna start with a phone call from chief to chief. LA City sent 10 fire engines, LA County sent 10, Ventura sent, I believe five, I'm, and don't quote me on those numbers. And that's all based on a phone call. And then what it does is that they follow up into the normal ordering process the normal financial process. Um, in the past, what we've always done is a fire engine doesn't leave your fire station until the, the payment piece is figured out, right? This can be expensive. And so these fire chiefs have come together and said, we're gonna share our resources by a phone call, get resources on the road and we'll figure out the finances after. Uh, last year, we donated a lot. We went up to LA City, LA County, uh, Ventura County, and this year um, we were able to ask for it back and it, it actually was, was incredible to see these resources start to show up. Large numbers of resources outside of 
the normal mutual aid system. And um, although it's still a normal <coughs> utilization of mutual aid, it just was even that much more um, efficient. So um, like I said, some of the big successes, um, just to summarize, fire prevention, the mutual aid system, and, um, and our large number of resources were able to get ahead of these two fires. And in my mind, very, very successful. And um, I think in, the only thing I ask of you is let's keep our, our two guys that are fighting um, in your minds as, uh, as they continue their challenges. And that kind of, that summarizes my report and I'm available for any questions if you have anything. I have one. Uh What's the uh, the wind, um, the maximum wind that uh, that large uh, helicopter can operate up to? I'm gonna. I'd have to make a guess at that. I, um, you know, the our our helicopters. You know, that was that was another thing. Is our, our all of our aircraft, um, both fixed wing and helicopters, were grounded um, during the majority of of this fight. Mm -hmm. uh, in the in the evening. Um, our, our new, the HC-47, the Type 1 large Sikorsky helicopter, and our helicopter were dropping on us um, and helping us greatly in the middle of the night. But like you're, you're bringing up, um, the air resources were grounded, and I, I don't have that answer in front of me. I'll have to do a little bit of research to find that out. Because I, I was waiting to see a lot of that, but I, I saw that wind. It was, the smoke was going horizontal, and so I, I knew that they had a... Uh, a limit as far as the the, uh, the wind. <clears throat> yeah, for, for the next meeting, I'll try to get you that information. Okay, not a, just a technical thing. Maybe sure. else have a question for the chief here. Uh, yeah, chief, I had, a, 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 well, it's a kind of a question and kind of a comment. I know we're probably gonna have to follow up on this later. Uh, on Sunday, I, 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 well, I was contacted by a couple of citizens that came upon a, one of our, our new homeless people in town, apparently had gotten off the bus here fairly recently. And on Sunday, she, middle-aged woman, uh, she was soaking wet and shivering. So uh, asked if they could help her and, uh, you know, by calling you guys and, and she was service acceptance, which was novel. And so they, they called 911 and, and you guys responded. And, I, and I, I think they actually transported her for, some hypothermia and you know what whatever issues and and my question is though I don't think there right now is is any mechanism for the fire department response communicating with the police as far as homeless goes and and, and I'm not talking about HEPA her condition or anything like that but it would seem to be really valuable if if you respond to a call and the police aren't there for whatever reason and it's a a homeless that if somehow the homeless uh, uh, enforcement officer or deputies in our city could somehow get that contact information so they could follow up, see if they could find her, maybe get CityNet involved. And, and I don't think we're doing that now. And I'm, I'm just wondering, maybe you could give me a cursory response to that possibility and then maybe we could go into a deeper layer. Sure, and, and, and I think it does happen. Um, not to say that there's there's never room for improvement. So as as fire, we we respond for the EMS portion of it, um, and and I'm going to ask Ed to chime in for a little bit. But the offering of services, if there's not a medical emergency, not something where we're going to transport, um, the sh the the sheriff has the ability to offer more resources than we do. Um, it is not uncommon for us to reach out to the sheriffs. It's also not uncommon. Many of our calls, especially at night with some of the homeless, uh, they're there with us, if not before us. So I think that transfer of information does occur. Um, none of our guys would ever hesitate to, to reach out to the deputy if, um, if we feel that there's a need for services. And that's an easy, uh, an easy transfer of information. So I think the avenue is there. And, um, and Ed, let, let me know if I'm missing anything on that. Yeah, no, if, if, well, especially if, I mean, if we're called and we're on scene, then we're, we're going to take it from there. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what Rick's talking about, about if, if you guys respond to a scene to a call that we do not um, respond to or are called to. Um, I think Rick's asking if, if we don't, how is that information disseminated to us? And uh, that, that part I can't answer because I, I don't know what mechanism is in place for that. 
Yeah. So, and, and I think it would be, um, you know, with the company officer and scene, if they don't meet a medical criteria or transport criteria, um, but there is a concern for them outside of normal homelessness. Um, now, every homeless person that we go on uh, that that does not meet that criteria, we don't call the sheriff to come and offer services for. Um, but if there's something outside of the ordinary that brings up a concern or weighs a red flag for us, um, I, th I think that communication would occur. Yeah, Chief, I'm, I'm specifically I'm talking about how th this person was transported. I don't right. know what happened to transport. The, 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 the deputies weren't involved. And I, I'm not talking about if they're, I'm not saying that you guys should even request the deputies for, 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 for services. I'm, I'm just saying that we have a homeless community here and she's going to return here if there'd be a, 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 a box we could check. So at least the homeless deputies got a blurb that somebody named Laura, you know, appeared to be homeless and we transferred for a medical. They will go find her again. You know, you know I, I mean, they'll, they'll know. Sure. They'll, they contact people every day. Just, just the heads up that this person at least was transferred by you. And then you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to ensure that they, <laughs> that they contact oh, of her. Course. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just looking for the heads up for the for the the homeless officers there. Any extra info they can get that. So, like, say maybe we can chat with that later and see if there's sure. a better way to facilitate that. Absolutely. Perfect. I really sure. appreciate it. Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah, that sounds like a, uh, a work plan. Uh... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can check that off the work plan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's good. You never know what's going to come up with it. Any other uh, things for the fire? Concern. Okay, let's go to marine safety. Okay, so on the marine safety side of things, uh, the weather is definitely done done a turn with the cold weather, the rain, water temperatures have dropped, and uh, beach activity is low. So there's no notable uh, reporting items to the community. And I do appreciate the time to uh, give a marine safety presentation to all of you. Great job, great job on that, and welcome to our little funny little committee here. Thank you, man. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, I don't have anything to uh, necessarily add other than uh, thank you to, to Adam for all the great work that he's doing on this and uh, uh, providing that staff work. So it, uh, we can at least have a blueprint of where we're going to go. And at least we have now have uh, something that uh, um, is expected of us. So in a little bit of a timeline. So. We can go from there, and and I, as I understand that uh, our probably our next meeting we'll probably have a status report on these work plans that each of us will be uh, um, reporting on. Committee okay. members, any volunteers, anything to say? Comments? Uh, yeah, I have something. Um, yeah. Adam, I have a question. Um, since we're not going to, we're going to be meeting the middle of December, but then not until the end of January. Um, one of the important things I think for a couple of committees is that we pick the, uh, the people that are going to be in our, in, in our committee as neighborhood watch, you know, we're probably going to want someone from OCS FD or SD to be there. Um, and so I think we could maybe come up for the December meeting to discuss that, um, that we could all come up and say, hey, we're gonna need a person from this de department and this department and be able to discuss that so we can determine who those persons are. If we wait till the end of January to do it, to do that, it's gonna, not gonna be till March till we get the first committee uh, meeting with all these important people. Um, what, is, what do you all think of that? Um. Based on the work plan implementation program that was adopted tonight, uh, you're not going to need to come back to the Public Safety Committee for approval on the appointment of every single member of your subcommittee that's overseeing the work. Because you're not at, while, you, while there's still work for the committee to do uh, related to this work plan project, um, as far as, as putting together your neighborhood watch group. At no point in time are you creating a quorum of the public safety committee 
nor are um, you uh, making decisions for the committee outside of an open meeting. So you, you have the direction at this point um, for the two members to organize and create this, this program, contact the people as you see fit, um, okay. you know, based on the the, you know, the general guidelines provided in the implementation program. Okay. So it, the, the next couple meetings, um, you, you, at most you're gonna be reporting back to the rest of the committee about what's going on with that. But as far as the actual work of getting that neighborhood watch program started, uh, it's feel free to, you know, feel free Good. to go, go for it. Um, we will need to talk with Lieutenant Manhart about some of the information that you need from police services. The budget uh, approved by the council for this item was about $7,500 and it anticipated uh, a city staff time um, of about two to four hours a week or so. Uh, I don't know to what extent, you know, the, the, the final uh, amount of time is gonna, gonna be uh, necessary, but um, we'll need to figure out who on city staff and um, who from OCSD can can assist in, in basically providing that information to, to, to so Rick and so Rick and I could contact uh, Lieutenant Manhart and we contact you and to find out who is going to who's going to be our contact for our our committee. Yeah, the four of us could get, even get have a meeting together and all talk at the same time. There's no there's no quorum there. Okay, thanks. Okay, I just want to say, you know, thanks for all the hard work and we can see as we go forward how important and it is to have fire, police and marine safety at our meetings. It really, really helps facilitate our, our work plan quicker when we can have everybody here. And a, a special shout out to uh, Deputy Johnson of uh, Traffic Enforcement for the OCSD. You know him if you saw him. He, he's, he's all over town uh, and enforcing traffic laws uh, stringently. Uh, he's a great resource here. I had an opportunity to call the routine number because of a traffic issue that I had in my neighborhood. He was Johnny on the spot and solved the problem quickly. And he's just a, 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 a real good uh, asset we have in, uh, in San Clemente. So uh, anyway, that's all. that's all I've got. Wonderful, wonderful. Gary, I think you're muted. <laughs> I mute myself so I won't have background noise disturbing things. <laughs> I forget. Uh, I, Lieutenant Meinhardt, I wanted to congratulate your department on the handling of a, uh, bar uh, a barricaded suspect last week in our city. Most people are probably unaware of it didn't make the news because it came out successful. He surrendered and uh, went and got hit care, but uh, it was an incident that could have uh, developed uh, quite dramatically different. And uh, I just want to commend you guys for the job well done. Thank you. Was that, was that the Vista Del Mar Apartments? Is that the one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. A lot of stuff happens. You know, we're also look, looking at uh, some new uh, council members coming on board. So I'm sure they're going to be watching what we're doing too on this. So any other uh, committee member comments? Got it. Okay. Adam, it's yours. Thank you, Chair Bercuda. Uh, members of the Public Safety Committee, a couple announcements. Um, the uh, Community Development Department has uh, recently uh, recruited and hired three new park rangers. We've been uh, tremendously short staffed during uh, this whole COVID period. Um, and so they, they, one will be starting next week. The other ones will be starting after their um, background check and onboarding is done. But over the next month or so, we hope to have uh, our staffing levels back to where they um, close to where they were uh, a year ago, um, which was, which was uh, nine, nine part-time staff. Uh, however, they were at that time, they were limited to 18 hours uh, per week a piece. Uh, we recently were approved um, to allow uh, 
some of the part-timers to go up to 30 hours a week. So we're, we're working on, on improving that program uh, and, uh, and, and training some new staff. On that note, some of the upcoming informational presentations uh, are, um, are being considered are uh, Stephen Foster with our emergency um, operations and planning uh, of the city. Um, I'd like to get him scheduled. Um, hopefully next at the next meeting, uh, he'll be available. If not, then the meeting after that. Um, with in those two same meetings, I, I'm planning to do an informational presentation on the park ranger program uh, as well. Um, this is something that the city has uh, has been working to improve uh, from the old park monitor program uh, and to create uh, park rangers that essentially have much more enforcement capability uh, in, the, in the city's public uh, parks and uh, beaches and and, uh, and and really be the you know the the some support for our our first responders uh, kind of free them up from um, some of the, the the more general tasks of city enforcement. Um, let's see. Um, oh, as uh, um, Chair Bracuta mentioned, the uh, the elections are over. We have some new city council members. Uh, just for everybody's information, they will be seated. Uh, at the first meeting of December. Uh, and at that meeting, they, um, I believe they're also gonna pick, uh, choose the mayor and the mayor pro tem for the next year. Um, so that's something to keep your eyes on. Um, I, um, I'll provide any information about that meeting if necessary. Um, let's see, and that was it. That's all I've got. One question, uh, December 15th is the next is what you're talking about on the city council meeting? Uh, no, the first meeting of December, I think is December 1st. Okay. That's the meeting that they'll be. Uh, yeah, December 1st, that's the meeting where the new council um, will be sat. Got it. All right. Anything for the good of the cause before we call it? All right. I'd like to make a motion that we adjourn this meeting of the public safety meeting and reconvene on Thursday, December the 17th at 10 a.m. for our next meeting. Second. Just making that. <laughs> um, let's go roll for that uh, motion. Uh, Vice Chair Janice. Aye. Uh, Committeeman uh, Loeffler. Aye. Committeeman Walsh. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Yes for me. We will uh, be back on the 17th of next month. 10 a.m. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And we'll be in touch. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>